joining all of the audio logistics for this webinar, and I'm going to go back next time. muted.
We're calling the CRA The broadcast is order. now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, listening audience. We have our invocation today. Ms. Desiree A. Jackson, please come to the podium. Ms. Jackson is a BS and JD Florida State University graduate. She also is a Hillsborough Terrier, the chaplain for the Tampa alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And most of all, she actually is a retired educator. So thank you for your service. Ms. Desiree Jackson, please stand. Unmuted. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Lord, we thank you for this glorious day. Let us all appreciate your grace. You've allowed us to assemble here together on behalf of the great city of Tampa. We celebrate our abilities to think, to walk, to speak, to hear, and to breathe. As the business of our fair city is conducted, let us only look to the hills from which cometh our help, because all of our help only comes from you. We thank you for every gift, every talent, all of our ideas, our abilities, our strengths, and even our weaknesses. Because of you, we have an opportunity to align, to connect, to learn, to unify in spite of our different personalities, opinions, cultures, beliefs, and purposes. Let us always remember the power of a united front in all aspects of our lives and especially for all of the people of the city of Tampa. Let us listen attentively Help us to give grace and mercy and understanding as we speak. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, because you are our strength and our redeemer. Thank you for peace and love to all. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. <laughs> okay, can we have roll call, please? Carlson? Here. Hurtak? Here. Clendenin? Here. Mastaco? Here. Vera? Miranda? Here. Henderson? Present. We have physical form. Thank you. Okay, so I need a motion to adopt the minutes from September 14th. Second. A motion from Councilman Allen Clendenin, second from Yes, Council, like I mean board member, board yes, member Clinton, and yeah, and a second from yeah. what's your name, Maniscalco. Guido Maniscalco. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, so we also have um, public comment this morning, and let's start with um, well, no, you know what, we'll do the agenda when we bring up, let's bring up the um, director for CRA and we'll go over some of the agenda cleanup items for today, and then we will. Take public comment. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. We are ready. Yeah. So we're going to. Um, I'll let you do it. Okay. Tell Great. a couple of the items. We're going to move some things up. Some things are going to be discontinued. Discontinued. Yeah. Continue to be continued. Like spoiled milk. Thank you. To be Not, continued. You know what I meant. <laughs> it's like a part two of a movie. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, well, I'll do it. I don't mind. So we're going to move item seven up for the Stras presentation after the director's report. Yep. Thank you. All in favor? All right. Okay. And then we're going to um, to be continued, not discontinued, four and six to until um, what day are we going to do it? November 9th? We're going to February. Con continue item four to February, February 8th. 8th. Yeah. So and continue item six to January 18th. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then we're going to. We are also going to continue item, item 11, 11 to next meeting, November 9th. Exactly. Item 11 to November 9th. All those in favor? A second? Aye. Any second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then I think that's it. That's it. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you so much. Uh, and now we're going to approve the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Okay. Yeah, I think we're going to, we, we might make it. We might break the record today. Okay, we have public comment, and there's one person online. We'll start with Mr. Randolph online and go to our audience who's present. Good. 
Good morning. Good My morning. name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West uh, Tampa CDC. I want to start off by thanking um, the head of the CRA for meeting with me um, to learn about what the West Tampa does and what can the uh, CRA uh, do to help the West Tampa CDC. At this point, we're meeting with the different banks to talk about uh, what's known as program-related investment loans. I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit long, later. But I want to talk about takeaways from the meeting. I have a background in both community and economic development as a petitioner. She understands the value of community development corporations and the value we bring to the table. She, like I, believe that we can reduce the impact of gentrification by design and by and intentionally. I believe that under her leadership, the CRA agency will be a model for the rest of the nation to model after. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Thank you. OK. We have public comments. We have public comments. First speaker, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Councilwoman Good morning. Henderson, council members. Um, I'm elated. I'm retired. I'm at peace. Um, I'm here this morning. I'm Jackson Heights Neighborhood Association President, first and foremost. I'm also a member of the East Tampa Community Revitalization Partnership. Um, I am here this morning. Can you to state your name for the record? I'm so sorry, Fran Tate. Yeah. Is that what it is? <laughs> is that what it, you get to relax? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman. I, I'm here this morning. We're, we're welcoming the restructuring. And I'm here to say that each and every neighbor association deserves a seat at the table um, for their input. They know what best is going on and what fits in their association um, boundaries. I know Jackson Heights and Mrs. Few knows uh, Belma Heights College Hill, Betty Bell knows Highland Pines, and so forth and so on. So when, when it is time to assign the seats at the CAC, please consider all of the CAC, I'm sorry, all of the neighborhood associations. It doesn't necessarily have to be the president, but someone from that association or someone from that area, someone in that boundary, please be given a fair and equal seat at the table. And we're looking forward to planning together a grocery store. I remember I had that conversation with the Councilwoman Henderson, grocery store. We're looking forward to that discussion, that planning, and that action actually moving forward. Thank you so very much for your time, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Few. I live at 4506 North 29th Street, Tampa, Florida, 33610. And I'm here on behalf of College Hill Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association. I'm the president. And uh, in the past, something happened that we were not made aware of. Our boundaries have changed. And uh, we used to be from 15th Street to 29th Street. And Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, 26 Ave. Now we're at 22nd Street to 29th and Lake Avenue to 26th Street. I don't disagree with it, but I'd just like to know why it was done and nobody notified us. When uh, we, in the past, when the uh, association was extended to 15th Street, uh, Marie Holmes sent out messages to all the neighbors, and we were given no notice of it being shrunk or s smaller. And I also would like to say that it has been confusing to understand the restructuring of the CRA, the CAC, and the East Tampa Revitalization Partnership. So if someone could make that clearer for us, I would love it because uh, we want to work together in harmony instead of chaos and disruption. Thank you. Thank you. Darling, make sure you get her information. Good morning. Good 
Good morning. Uh, good morning, esteemed members of City Council. My name is Jeffrey Amos, and I am the president of the historic Belma Heights Neighborhood Association. I stand before you today to discuss the important matter of reestablishing the boundaries of historic Belmont Heights. This is a matter of great significance for our community and our heritage as well as our future. Historic Belmont Heights has been an integral part of our city's history with its rich tapestry of memories woven into its very fabric. However, as time has passed, the original boundaries of the historic district have been eroded and it's essential that we take action to preserve its cultural and architectural difference. Here are three compelling reasons for establishing the boundaries of historic Belmont Heights. Preservation of heritage. The heart of any thriving city lies in its history and cultural heritage and by reestablishing the boundaries of historic Belmont Heights, we are safeguarding the stories and memories of generations past. This historical district is a treasure trove of styles and stories that deserve protection for generations to come. Number two, economic growth. Historic districts are known to attract tourism and promote <coughs> economic growth. These areas are both uh, unique destinations and drawing its visitors who appreciate charm and a sense of history. By, expound, by expanding the boundaries of historic Belmont Heights, we can encourage local businesses, tourism, and an influx of new residents boosting the local economy. Community cohesion. A well-defined district creates a sense of community pride and belonging. It fosters a shared identity and responsibility amongst residents. By reestablishing the boundaries, we definitely would um, foster a sense of unity and pride amongst those who live within the borders. In conclusion, reestablishing the boundaries of historic Belmont Heights is about preserving the soul of our city. It's about honoring the stories of those who came before us and ensuring that future generations have the opportunity to experience the beauty and charm of this unique district. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Eileen Henderson, and I serve as the VP for the Historic Belmont Heights Neighborhood Association. I'm here to support what Mr. Amos just explained to all of you. Um, I definitely think we need to look at boundaries in terms of the neighborhood associations. What I have seen is there's, there's no consistency. So I'd really like for us to start a dialogue to look at these neighborhood associations because I think it's imperative that we get some consistency. I think we need to definitely check with our Hillsborough County Property Appraiser's Office to see what they've established. And if there's any variations, I'd like to see a process put in place so that if there are associations, because what I have found with working with Historic Belmont Heights is a lot of it is memory. I lived here and it was Belmont Heights, or I was here and it was Belmont Heights, and they've cornered off the four areas. And so that's important because what we have found is sometimes history isn't always remembered correctly. And sometimes it's erased and forgotten. So I think it's extremely important that it's, I, I, I feel it has to stem from council. We need to look at these neighborhood associations. We have encroachment going on, and I don't think that's okay. But definitely open the dialogue, look at it. I am going to support Hillsborough Belmont Heights, Hillsborough <laughs> Historic Belmont Heights with what they're suggesting for those boundaries to be established. From there, we're going to look to get a local historic designation for the neighborhood so that we can make sure that it stays intact and we get it into the books. The only other thing that I'd like to say today is uh, there is an event this weekend, and it's called Legacies in Place, Memories in Mind. And it is a tribute to Memorial Park Cemetery, which does reside in Belmont Heights, but according to some maps, it does not. Uh, also, Belmont Heights Little League, according to some maps, does not reside in Belmont Heights, which is astounding to me. 
Anyway, the event is this Saturday, October 14th. I'd love for all of you to be there, to hear about Memorial Park Cemetery, to hear about the history that's important, and maybe later discuss a little bit about how we're going to evaluate those boundaries and make sure that we get them right. Thank you, Council. Thank you. <laughs> the event is from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And it is sponsored by USF, Dr. Antoinette Jackson and Walter Jenkins. Thank you. Uhuru, Mentesnot, you can't make this stuff up, I'm telling you. The word is accountability, and another word is insensitivity. And another word is accepting responsibility. Anybody know in a modern society they're going to push the poor and working class people outside the city limits? That's the only way you can continue raising taxes. So all these African people coming down here begging for boundaries, begging for parks, begging for recreation centers, begging, 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 and we're 26% of the population, and they're reducing it every day, every week, every month, every year. They're reducing it. They're pushing us out in places. They don't even accept Section 8 and a bunch of other stuff they don't accept. Start accepting responsibility and organizing that fashion. Down here begging for homeless people, beg, just begging, begging, uh, making African people ashamed to be African. Because every time somebody see an African person, they think they're looking at a beggar. The fact of the matter is, I wore red today for the blood of the people of Palestine. And it's a shame people are down here right now today talking about their little problems. And in Palestine, the people are getting genocide and mass murder in the worst way. And it's been going on since May 15, 1948, when England, Germany, France, and the United States made a problem by taking some expatriated Germans and putting them on the Palestinian land in order to hold down the oil situation for them. Put a military base right there in the heart of the Arab and Muslim's population and holding them down. And this city council need to condemn Condemn what Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu is doing in Palestine. Bragging what Joseph Biden is doing in Palestine. Bragging they destroyed 400 buildings in what? In residential areas. Because of what? They trying to show you white life is so important. They showed Africans that all the way back to Nat Turner. When Nat Turner tried to say I want to resist slavery, the white people murdered a bunch of Africans. And that's what they're doing in Palestine right now. They're trying to show you white life is so precious and so important, they're going to murder a bunch of Palestinians just under house. And any African person vote for Joseph Biden, they're out of their mind, period, because he had a crime bill with Bill Clinton that devastated the African community. And now you see what he's doing in Palestine. This city council needs to condemn what's going on in Palestine. Next speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Keila McCaskill, and I'm here. Uh, I shared with you on last week some concerns regarding the restructure of the um, CRA. And it's not a concern as, as, it, as it relates to a challenge as much, but an opportunity to collaboratively work with the community engagement and the neighborhoods, uh, drum go, uh, Travis, Moody, I have confidence that from what they've done overall, they, they know what it takes to actually have an impact in a community like East Tampa and Ebor and any of the other ones where they made this restructure. I think they do have the ingredients to do that, but I wanted to make sure that you all make certain it does not exclude community involvement. I don't want to see an inactive neighborhood at the table. They don't want to be there. I've spoken with them. They would like to make a nomination. But I don't need to give that message to you. I would like for you all to make sure as you communicate with neighborhood engagement and the staff, the administration, that that happens. So I'm confident that that will happen. I've seen the progress. I do believe with this team will see the results that we're asking for. I'm just asking that you're more engaged in making sure that your constituents have a seat at that table and their involvement is factored in. I'm also here 
regarding some of the businesses in this area. I host the American Dream Fest, which is a workshop that includes everybody's dreams. For some, it's home ownership. For some, it's entrepreneurship. And for others, it's financial freedom. And for some, it's all of that. So I'm working with a lot of the businesses in some of these marginalized communities. And what I'm seeing is that they need some assistance. They need technical assistance. I wrote a program with one of the lenders locally to give them opportunities, give them a contract if they could get an approval. Most of them can't even walk through the process to get a approval from the city of Tampa to go receive free money from a bank because they don't have the know-how. I can't do it all, but there are some organizations that do. I know specifically one organization that's dumped over $73 million in Tampa to help some of these businesses with new market tax credits and everything else. And you guys probably don't even know their name. I'm asking that Nicole Travis a few weeks ago gave you a list of organizations that provide these services that could potentially help these businesses, you're going to get a, a, before you a contract to renew for about $550,000. I'm asking that you don't. I'm asking you to evaluate the other organizations that's already serviced in this area that can give us the much needed assistance if you just research them. I want you to ask for receipts from those that are receiving these contracts. Don't just rubber stamp another renewal without asking them for receipts. I would like for you to go back to Ms. Travis, ask her for that list of organizations, Mr. Drumgo, and even Mr. Lopez, the economic, um, he's responsible for the economic growth in East Tampa. Ask them who's providing the results that we're asking for for these businesses. We cannot afford to continue to rubber stamp organizations that can't give you any receipts. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Steve Michelini. Good morning. Uh, as many of you uh, know that there was a, uh, a community meeting last night regarding parking in Ybor City. <clears throat> One of the suggestions that, uh, that we advanced was to request that the police department update their safety uh, plan regarding Ybor City and for, for them to identify additional manpower that might be required to provide safety <clears throat> for the entire residents. The issue results really from the area becoming an entertainment district and not any one specific property owner. So one of the things that we were also advocating was that the, the CRA take, make a motion regarding the action plan to be developed. It's coming back to you in February. So perhaps that by then you will have a new action plan and the funding that was required uh, for additional officers and that to initiate that plan. Also, that the funds required for that come from the CRA um, to supplement the officers that are already on duty in, in that district. So I would respectfully request that you make a motion to ask the police department to update their safety plan, and second, to come forward with a, a manning and cost analysis that the funds would come from CRA. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Robin Lockett. Uh, two things. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Keela in regards to not rubber stamping renewals. You guys did a lot of work uh, with that budget, dissecting it. So take the opportunity to look at who's producing, who's providing receipts, and not just automatically give that money or renew a contract. There's a lot of small businesses out here that do are doing the work on pennies and not getting money from you or they haven't been approved for the same business. So please take time to uh, just not rubber stamp it. Um, second thing is, uh, some of you guys are on my Facebook page. I want to tell you that uh, Pastor Williams went missing. He has now been found, located rather. <laughs> located, uh, he's safe. Bill, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, conversation and what you did and I want to you know I fuss about the police when they're wrong but I want to you know commend them for being on top of it uh, just uh, assigning someone to his case and the help that they provided so I want to uh, give this opportunity to thank Tampa police also but thank you and, and uh, Lewis Brandon uh, reached out to me also so and he's not my grandfather I'm a friend of the family <laughs> so thank you Good morning, happy Thursday. And um, I just want to say um, thank God for everything. And he who gives to the poor, uh, lending to the poor, he gives back. 
And I just uh, want to thank everyone and for the help that I had. And now I'm um, facing a little, I have my fundraiser going on. And I think I talked to, to Councilman Vieira, I haven't talked to um, Sister Hertak and um, I can't think of your name, sir, but those are the only two. And I know you have to have one million pennies for ten thousand dollars. So and so I need two two hundred point five million pennies to make up my twenty five thousand dollars. So all those who have spare pennies, don't just throw them on the dresser. If the kids don't get them, you can send them to me because uh, two million pennies would be a good thing. So I have to now work on fundraising and I have my plan. I have to revise it. And it seems like paper is more important than human beings. I just have to say that. And I still give God thanks. And for um, Miss Sister Vicki here, calling me early this morning, explaining, you know, and I got 99 miles left for walking, 5,000 miles for housing and homelessness. Mm. But that don't seem to matter. The work I put in, I got a book of work. Now I let my LLC, and I got to come up with $600 to appease them, but I'm still thankful. And I thank God for everything he do. And like I say, I'm trying to open up. I passed all the tests. I'm a vendor for housing. I can't get in touch with Mr. Guy to tell me to get a pre-lease to tell me how much I have. I've been All I've been doing is jumping through hoops, <laughs> getting things right. And still there's no money for me. And I'm raising money and like I say, a dollar or a pennies Send it to me, 102 East Patterson Street, number 317. And my space is right across the street, just sitting there empty. And all I need is a few resources. And I thank everybody and Miss Erica for calling me. But somehow I'm going to make it. She called me early, and I was really feeling bad yesterday. I got wet in the rain. But God also provides, and he going to provide for me. And y'all come on and let's unite and get some money to the poor and to the small businesses that are struggling. Help me out. Thank, Thank you. Ms. Allie. Ms. Allie. Yes. For the record, say your full name for the record, Ms. Allie. Sally. Sally yes, Yessie Lee. Thank the, you. the Volunteer Missionary Society Penny Fund. I think Hope you need for a big, America. I think you need a bigger purse. I know. I've got, I had 100 surveys to do, and I'm down to like 10. Critical issues for seniors, everything that's going on. And one thing more thing I could say. I have to thank uh, Governor DeSantis. One morning I was sitting in my bathroom at 3 o'clock. I wrote okay. to him and to the director of education and the lieutenant governor, and he got rid of FCAT. That's why I know what God can do. Okay, Miss. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, next speaker, please. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Noreen Copeland Miller, and I'm 30 plus year resident of the historic Bama Heights neighborhood. I want to um, say that I'm honored to stand here this morning. You've heard um, my president come up, vice chair. I'm the secretary of the historic Bama Heights Neighborhood Association. We have invited um, city staff to come in and join and work with us, and that has happened. And I really want to say that the Department of Community Engagement and Neighborhood Association has been very accommodating, working with us, coming to our meetings, going over the process and making sure that we were in um, compliance with the City Neighborhood Association. So this has been going on for months that we've been um, talking about boundaries and all that. Some folks say they didn't know about it. We've had a reunion, some folks attended, but say they still didn't know. We invite everyone to come to our meetings. 
we meet at Cyrus Green um, Park the first Wednesday of the month. And it's not a secret, and we invite the community to come out. We are here talking about our boundaries, and I'm asking that you all support the, boundary, the petition we have going around about the boundaries. I lived in, Bama, in Ponce Leon housing complex. That was known as Bama Heights, all the way down to 21st. But some things have changed, and we know change does come. Only thing we ask that we respect the historic Bama Heights neighborhood because it's a lot going on there. And as they were talking about the map, I want to read to you from uh, the general demographic characteristics where I found that the original map came from. And most of the demographic data was subsequent that the destination was compiled by Social Compact Inc who relied on their own East Tampa study area as well as the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission, the 2000 Census, and the Tampa St. Petersburg Metropolitan Statistical Area data. Social Compact 2000 Census East Central Map was relied on for the data from Census Track 18, 19, 20, 31, 33, 34, and 35 which in combination are the operative basis for this map that we're talking about, the boundaries. So if you're looking to see where the original map is, I encourage you to do that. But again, I want to say thank you for all the work you're doing. And we ask that you support the historic Bama High Neighborhood Association boundary. Thank you for your time. OK, thank you so much. We are closing public comment. And moving on to item number one, which is the report from CAC Chair Kimberly Curtis. Hello. Good morning, CRA Board and Chair Henderson. Um, some of you I've seen before. I think there's a few new faces. So nice to meet you. I am Kimberly Curtis. I am the chair of the Channel District uh, CAC. I'm here to give you guys a few updates about what's going on in the district. Um, bear with me. We have a lot going on, but I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. If you have any questions about anything along the way, feel free to, to stop me, interrupt, and I'll answer what I can. And if I can't, then I'll uh, rely on Erica and, and Courtney to help me out. So, um, as of last month, we welcomed um, a new member, Brent Hill, and after today, um, we are requesting approval for another new member, Stephen McLaughlin. After that, we will have uh, a full uh, committee and be at capacity. The, uh, we generally meet at the uh, Tampa, uh, Port Tampa boardroom uh, first Wednesday of each month. Sorry, this, my vision's getting really bad. It's like crazy how quickly your vision starts going and you have to start doing this. Sorry. Um, so we generally meet at the uh, uh, boardroom of Port Tampa Bay first Wednesday of each month, 5.30. We are, uh, our contract for our infrastructure improvements are ongoing. We've been at it for a couple years. We still have a bit more work to do, probably a couple years worth left. Um, right now, GMP2, Kimmins has completed upgrades to walks and sidewalks and streetscape, utility work. Um, we uh, completed the uh, sales park that's right across from the little pocket park that's right across from the aquarium and Terminal 3. Uh, that approximate cost of that project was around 1.6 million. Our GMP4 is the Cumberland Avenue uh, improvements from Channel Side Drive to Meridian. We're less than a month away from completing that, uh, that which included uh, some storm drainage improvements, new sidewalks, a couple of off-street parking spaces. Our uh, cost on that was approximately 1.1, 8.1 million. Uh, the next phase will be GMP5. That's twigs to, uh, from North Meridian to 12. Uh, let's see. That'll include new roadway construction, resurfacing, burying of the overhead, overhead utilities, and um, remediation of all the localized flooding. That area tends to flood pretty, pretty badly, and the water stands for several days. So that's a major issue for residents and uh, people walking through there. So that will be really good to get that fixed. So that one is currently pending final budget approval. Uh, the next item is wayfinding signage. Uh, we approved funding for joint participation in the study. Uh, the, the amount we approved for that from the Channel District is 250000 from FY23 budget. Uh, API completed the study and documented the destinations within the Channel District, Downtown Central Park, and Tampa Heights. They provided locations. 
excuse me, and conceptual designs for wayfinding signage. Uh, they've completed phase one, which is analysis. Phase two will be reprogramming. And phase three will be conceptual design. And that will be presented at a workshop uh, that's attended by all the team stakeholders. And I believe that's open to the public as well, I think. Is that open to the public? We anticipate that, uh, bringing that to you guys by the end of the year. Um, all right, last item, our landscape services contract. We are working with Parks Department and purchasing on bidding out the work to enhance landscaping throughout the district. Um, that would include uh, all, all within our whole boundaries from Meridian, Channelside Drive, Adamo to Channelside. We anticipate the release of that bid no later than this week. So that work will be kind of taking the, the public areas and sort of cleaning them up a little bit, doing some plantings, flowers, just general landscape improvements that kind of go above and beyond what uh, the city contract currently currently does for us. So that's all I have. Anybody have any questions for me this morning? No? Okay. Questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you for the report. Sure. Okay. Moving on to the director of CRA, Ms. Erica Moody. Good morning, board. Good morning. Well, I'm excited to be here as your CRA director. My name is Erica Moody, for the record. And we have quite a few updates uh, and things that have happened over the last month. So I look forward to spending some time and letting you all know what we've been up to. The first is restructuring. So as you know, I was brought in to really restructure our staff and also realign all of our programs, grants, and operations. So it's been a lot of focus on process improvement in recruiting talent and then also tapping into the skill set and having a strengths-based approach with the, the current staff that we do have. So with that, uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Burton was the CRA manager for downtown, Channelside, Tampa Heights, and Central Park CRA districts. Uh, he left us on, on August 25th, and uh, of course that created a gap that needed to be, be filled. So we've been really busy keeping these districts going, engaging with the CACs, and we are happy to have identified our talent from within. Uh, so I will be announcing uh, today, right now, our new interim director for the downtown districts, uh, Miss Courtney Orr, and I think she's behind me. If you want to wave. <laughs> So uh, this is really exciting. Courtney has been a CRA manager for the Ebor District for the last eight years, which just shows the investment and commitment that she has to the role. Uh, previously, she was the downtown CRA manager for the city of Clearwater uh, and also has a lot of experience working in Chamber of Commerce and business and economic development, which is just perfect fit for the downtown district. So we're really excited to give her this new opportunity from within and challenge her in, in new ways uh, for professional growth. So congratulations, Manager Orr. You're already doing a great job. Uh, example, working with Kimberly for the update today. So as Courtney moves into the downtown districts, that created a gap in Ebor uh, with, with the Ebor CRA manager. And we looked from within and we found, we realized that um, Miss Brenda Thrower has been with the Ebor CRA for over 20, 25 years. Uh, so that is just so impressive and she's just a staple in the community. She knows every single building, the history, and it was great as we interviewed her, just her commitment to Ebor as a historic district. Uh, she's also the incoming president for the Florida Redevelopment Association. So uh, this is just a perfect opportunity for her to step up into a management role. So we're really excited to announce Brenda Thrower as our new interim Ebor CRA manager. This, this is great and just so exciting to be able to reinvigorate our staff. I know that they're working hard, showing their commitment. It is an interim position uh, to see you know, how this all lays out. So it will be an interim position from October 1st to April 1st, 2024. Uh, so that is six months, and then we'll give you an update at, at that time. So congratulations to our managers. Uh, we've also had a, a very big hire uh, and change within the, the CRA. This is all part of the restructure to where the CRA managers are no longer expected to be professional project managers, grant administrators, fiscal analysis, and they could really focus on engaging with the community and being that liaison and conduit to the CRA board uh, and myself so we can represent the community desires and needs. Uh, so that is the main focus of, of the community engagement managers now, to really lead the CR CAC meetings in the same fashion as we prepare for the CRA board meetings like today. Uh, with that, they will no longer have staff underneath them, so they can just focus on the community, and we are starting to develop these work units. Uh, the work units will be the grants team, 
the housing team, and the project coordination team. And then we also have our administrative staff um, really taking on a lot of the admin responsibilities. So we are starting to build these work units, and we have hired an economic development coordinator uh, who will oversee all of our grants and program administration. And now the staff that was previously reporting to the CRA managers and implementing the grants and programs are all aligned under a grant team. Um, so they will be working across dis districts, uh, sharing their skill sets. They are already collaborating and meeting weekly. And it's just nice to see everyone come together and be so receptive to the change. So with our economic development coordinator, now they have the grants team and the CRA managers will be focusing on community engagement. So with that, I'd like to announce our new economic development coordinator is Ms. Diario Reed. Uh, you may have seen her around. She also goes by D. Reed. And I believe she's here today if you want to just wave. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate how important this is because this is the shift to create the work units. Um, and we're really excited to have Dee on board with us. She was previously the senior project manager with the city of Lakeland and is just already coming in with great ideas on how to streamline efficiencies and workflow and it's only week two. Uh, so we're really excited for this. We've been training our staff, bringing them on board, sharing the mission, the vision, the objectives that have been adopted by the board and uh, we, are, we are moving forward. So. Uh, it's really fast uh, and aggressive change, but this is this is how the restructure is taking place, and then we're looking forward to everyone settling in and uh, really running with it. So, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the community or or staff because this is this is a collaborative effort. Uh, just a, a, a couple more updates. We uh, we have extended an offer to an office support specialist. They'll be receiving and processing invoices and making sure that everything's in a streamlined flow. I'll speak on that in a little bit. So we've offered the position to Ms. Tamia Dorton uh, to be our OSS3, and she will be starting on Monday. And then just a reminder of some of the other staff changes that have taken place previously to today. We do have a senior project manager. That's the project work unit team. And we did hire an administrative assistant, and he has been just rocking it. Um, so we're starting to get these processes in alignment. It does take time to really dissect everything and take it apart and then put it back together. And we'll start to bring these recommendations to the board for input and approval. Uh, so yes, we're really, we're really happy about our our uh, new staff and moving forward uh, swimmingly. So congratulations to everyone who has been uh, brought on to the team. A little bit more on uh, staffing. We do have an open position for community development coordinator. It's currently online on our website. So if you are uh, in the field of affordable housing, workforce, uh, this is really where we're building out our housing unit team. So the community development coordinator position is online right now and will remain open until October 16th. So if you wanna join the team, that would be an opportunity to do so. We're also rep recruiting project coordinator and an urban planner. And that's the staff update. Uh, any questions? I'll pause there before moving on. Board member Clendon. I just want to make a comment. I think that you are just a uh, productive tornado. <laughs> I mean, I, your, your level of energy and, and what you're doing and, and the recreation of, of this and reimagination of what we're doing in the city of Tampa is inspiring. I think that, I, you know, I know, I know somebody said earlier in public comment that, you know, change is inevitable, but, you know, uh, as we evolve and we grow, I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity for the city of Tampa and the CRAs, and I appreciate the work that you and your staff is doing. I think uh, good job, keep it up, and I look forward to you know seeing the, the fruit of, uh, of, of what you're planning right now. Thank you. Thank board you. Member Hertek, Board Member Maniscalco. Thank you, uh, and I just want to echo what uh, Board Member Clendenin said. Uh, thank you so much. It's your, your team is all smiles too, which is great. And i um, thrilled that you can grow within, and I really appreciate these updates to talk about each person, what they're doing, um, so that the community is also uh, you know, in the loop. And I love the way that you, you mentioned that we're hiring. I think that's really brilliant. I mean, <laughs> people who tune into these meetings uh, are the, t the type that, that would be interested. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, and I look forward to you. Uh, you know, all the extra effort. I love the way we're streamlining grants and streamlining. I mean, this is stuff we've already talked about, but it's so wonderful to see it in action. So thank you so much. My apologies, okay. Board Member Miranda and then Maniscalco. Oh, both of them start with M, so it's all right. <laughs> you know, you're, you're I, younger. I want to echo what my colleague said, but the thing that impressed me the most is how can you speak for that period of time without taking a breath? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>
It's called girl power. Yeah. Thank you very it much. Is. <laughs> I do hold my breath, so that is accurate. <laughs> Thank you so much. Was, was there anything else? Maniscalco? Oh, I just wanted to uh, congratulate uh, Ms. Thrower and Orr and, and all the mm -hmm. other uh, new hires and positions. Uh, you're doing a great job. I heard we, we got somebody from Lakeland. That's not the first person. A lot of people come from yeah, Lakeland. She's intern. And um, a lot of good people coming from there. But uh, you are doing a fantastic job. We had a great conversation the other day, um, you know, an in, in update of today's CRA meeting. And you said something at the end. You said, well, you're my boss. Mm -hmm. It's. I don't look at it like that. We're a team. Yeah. All of us working in collaboration, and you're showing that collaboration, working together, uh, streamlining the process. Councilwoman Hertag mentioned a couple of, of, uh, of things just now, but uh, I'm I'm glad to see the direction that we're going in, because back in the day when I started, CRA meetings were very short. We'd be out of here in two hours or less. Now they're very robust because there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. We see the growth in downtown. We see the growth in East Tampa. We see the growth. In West Tampa, West Tampa CRA was new when I came on. We had, we had just voted to create that, but you're doing a great job. And again, I like the direction that we're going in. Keep up the great work, and I look forward to all the good things that are coming. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, board Member Vieira. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate it. I, I just wanted to add on, and, and you know, we've had a lot of conversations, and I have just a, a wonderful impression of you, and I can tell that you're um, a real bleeding heart, and that's mm -hmm. the best compliment I can give someone. So thank you. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, in wrapping it up, um, Ms. Orr, Ms. Thrower, Ms. Reed, congratulations on your appointments within our commu workforce community. Of course, um, whatever you need, you have the right team in front of you, and we are definitely supportive of all the decisions that have been made because that's what we hired you to do. So great job to the entire, entire staff in getting you all on board. And thank you for introducing them to the community. Um, the six months, I wanted to ask you about that and just wrap that up. Is that um, ordinary in terms of that level of position to do a six-month trial, or is this something that you asked for to see if you want to be with us that long? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, so the six months is really to get into the role and okay. make sure that it's a good fit and it's what they want to do, mm -hmm. and then um, you know, seeing if it can become a permanent position. Understood. Yes. Okay. Was it a part of our budget? Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Then moving on. Absolutely. Um, just a couple comments. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your feedback. It means so much. Um, I'm here for the community, so I appreciate the comments, but I have a whole team behind me. Of course. Um, I have great advisors with uh, Mr. Drumgo and Ms. Travis, uh, as well as um, HR. So I wanted to give HR a huge sh shout out. Um, Ms. Kelly Austin, uh, Madeline Victorero, and um, Tracy Wilcox have just been amazing. So H, all of this is HR functions and they have been answering every question, uh, onboarding and providing the training as well. So it, is, it takes a whole team of people and I appreciate that we could work together to move it forward. Um, also uh, to a few comments, I think we are doing a great job of updating the CRA board on these changes in the restructure, but I do recognize that this needs to come to the CAC level as well. So I've scheduled to do um, to attend CACs uh, at least two a month so I can bring these updates and provide at least quarterly updates and bring the same information to the CAC and be able to represent uh, that communication. So I will be making my rounds uh, even more than I, than I am now. So thank you so much, uh, board, and thank you for everyone who is a part of making this update possible. And congratulations to our new staff. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to item number seven, which oh, is the, well, oh, you're not done? Oh, I'm, I'm oh, just getting more. started. That was just okay. <laughs> okay. I, hey, I'm not rushing you. We're just trying to get out of here for lunch. Do you need a time limit on the, on the record? <laughs> you might. You might. You might. Oh, um, proceed, Ms. Moody. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll just I'll just kind of uh, fly through what I can, but just some process improvement. Sure. Uh, we literally sit down, we just whiteboard everything, we put it on the wall, and we say let's let's put it into place and see where it makes sense. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that we're providing great board updates, and the memos are on point, and the presentations are ready and comprehensive. So we have developed a um, new deadline calendar for CRA board meetings. I have it in front of me. I won't put it on the Elmo, but if you'd like to see it, uh, you definitely can. But this is more of our internal deadlines for managers to provide this information for my review to get to you. And then, as I said, there's a lot of people involved. So it goes to Mr. Drumgo, Ms. Travis, um, legal, 
uh, chief of staff, uh, and finance. So it's a whole team of reviewers, and we just want to make sure that we can meet our deadlines and bring great updates to you. So we have implemented uh, CRA board uh, internal deadlines as well. Uh, an additional process improvement that we've done is instead of managers and staff receiving invoices uh, to them and then them submitting it to our admin team, the vendors will now submit invoices straight to our admin team. So we've created an email at crainvoices at tampagov.net. So we have notified all of our vendors that now uh, we're streamlining our invoice process and all invoices will go to one single email and be processed through there. So that just uh, explains taking the administrative burden off of some of our other staff mm -hmm. and uh, putting it where it belongs. So we have created that email as well for process improvement. So I just wanted to mention that. You know what, can you just give us an example of what's on the calendar? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so today is the CRA board meeting, so that's our focus, and then tomorrow I start reviewing uh, the November items. So for example, if, the, if our board makes a motion uh, today to bring something back in November, it's essentially past our internal deadline. Um, so just trying to explain how we want to set uh, deadlines as we move forward, knowing that we're already uh, past the next meeting uh, deadline. So just wanted to explain that so then we can start kind of setting things out a little bit further to allow staff to meet with the stakeholders do the work, do the budget analysis, and then bring it all in a good report for you. So uh, tomorrow I will be reviewing all of the November items for our November 9th board meeting. Thank you. How about we just try not to ask the board to get the next November? That sounds good. <laughs> no, we're, we're great. Uh, November will be a good meeting and December is jam-packed, so we're excited uh, for our December updates as well. Great. All right, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I also wanted to mention, just like we have an open position online to join our team, we also have an open RFP uh, that's currently available. You can go to uh, Get All or Demand Star and type in City of Tampa and look at for active RFPs. This RFP is for uh, Columbus Drive, and we are currently in the cone of silence, so I cannot answer any questions. If you had questions about this RFP, you would go through Get All or Demand Star and submit your questions there. Uh, but it is a very exciting going on uh, project going on in <coughs> East Tampa. It is a mixed-use project that will serve as a live and work hub in the East Tampa community redevelopment area. A portion of the project will be tailored towards creative manufacturing and innovation, as well as business incubation and acceleration, and include the operation of uh, East Tampa Manufacturing Center. Uh, so this is where local entrepreneurs can take product-based ideas throughout the full business life cycle of inception, design, prototyping, commercialization, and scaling. So it's East Tampa Manufacturing Center as well as an affordable housing uh, workforce component. So this is uh, proposals for a live-work opportunity to reduce the need for transportation while providing sustainable uh, community with, with eco-friendly uh, designs. So we are prioritizing that households are at or below 80% AMI uh, will be considered in the application and additional points uh, will be given to applicants that are 50% uh, AMI as well. So wanted to just showcase that open RFP and show how we're creating these live and work um, situations. So we look forward to receiving the bids on that and it will be a public opening for a sealed bids that will invite the community to participate in as well. Mm -hmm. Board Member Hurtet. Thank you. I have a general question, yes. and it's just this is the first time we're hearing about this, and this is, you know, that sort of stuff I would have expected to come through us beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe in the future, uh, just because if, if we're doing this RFP, and it sounds wonderful, but mm -hmm. we have no background knowledge about this project. So going forward before the RFP, because we all might have ideas, or mm -hmm. but... But I'm just I'm just surprised that we're hearing about this now. So, thank you, Board Member Carlson. Yeah, same thing here. I, I thought maybe I was the only one that didn't know about it. But um, um, where did the idea come from, and 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 do you know why it wasn't brought before the board? Mm -hmm. Yes, so th this is why I want to share it with the board. I thought it was important, so I definitely hear and receive your comments. Uh, this was a, this is a disposition of city property to create the live the live work um, situation. So it's focused on manufacturing. It's currently a small manufacturing center. So going with the current use and scaling it up into an East Tampa manufacturing center and having an affordable workforce component. And uh, Mr. Jumgo may have more comments on that. Yeah, I want to just make a comment um, regarding it because I actually was aware of it a little bit. I know that sure. it's going to be an RFP. Um, 
Is this something that, and you can answer this, Mr. Drumgo, sure. um, in terms of your position and staff, when you all work, is do you need our permission to bring forward an RFP so that's in, a, in all situations? That's a great uh, question, Madam Chair. So uh, for the record, uh, Elise Drumgo, Deputy Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity. I know in the past that this board has asked for RFPs that involve CRA assets, CRA properties to come back before you before we issue them. We do have other projects that are in the pipeline that we're planning that we do intend to bring back before you. But given that this is city-owned property, there are no assets um, at this time that are being requested of the CRA board. Um, and so generally, we're just going forward from as a matter of business. Um, as you all may know that East Tampa has a huge manufacturing, or excuse me, an, an industrial district that is that is waning and so uh, there are opportunities to preserve those industrial uses while also leaning on activities from the port our trade zone there and then also uh, this particular property is along the i4 corridor which is pretty critical when you think about transit transportation and uh, logistics and so when we looked at this uh, very closely we saw this as an opportunity to build on those particular uh, assets that are already existing, preserve the industrial because it is something that we're losing to residential uses. As you all know as well that, you know, live local impacts some commercial districts and other industrial areas. And so what we're trying to do is really um, maintain this area so that we can continue to build on that and by providing for this opportunity for manufacturing and uh, the manufacturing expansion, we're also um, helping those businesses that are there to be able to utilize that space to scale and then also to test products. So, um, you know, great opportunity to integrate those items as well as affordable housing while also looking at job, job training opportunities being integrated into that space for those folks who are out in East Tampa. So, um, so just very directly to answer that question, you know, we don't necessarily need the approval of this body uh, to, to issue an RFP and then contractually, you know, once we, once we uh, get into a space where we've negotiated all of these items, you would certainly hear it as a council and you would be briefed in advance <coughs> on the direction that we're taking. Okay, just a matter of business. So what is the deadline for the RFP? October 30th. Okay. Okay, more questions? Okay. Board Member yeah. Clendenin and yeah. then Board Member Urte. I don't want to pile on, and obviously it sounds like a great, great program, but this is one of those things where it's, it's disappointing to, to hear at this level that um, it wasn't brought in, you know, that I, I, when, when, I, when I heard um, Mr. Trump, when I heard you speak about don't have to, just because you don't, uh, you know, it's just because you can doesn't mean you should scenario, which, you know, try to teach my children when they were growing up is that nobody likes to be surprised. And I appreciate, and honestly, I appreciate the fact that you brought this up today, by the way. Um, but we, you know, this is, this should be more of a partnership and nobody likes to be surprised. And I was, I, I echo what I heard over here to my right. I, I, was, I was sitting here thinking, because you know, I've only been here since May, maybe this was something that was discussed before. <laughs> so a lot of times when these things come up, I kind of like bite my tongue, because I'm thinking, well, clearly this was something that had been discussed or brought in, brought in, as, in discussion. So I think in the future, as we move through these things, we, we, we need to be looked as a partner in the city. And you know, because you know, good ideas are good ideas, and you know, you could have seven people here that have your back instead of coming at the front. So you know, you want to bring everybody on board to make sure that they, they understand the message, they understand what you're trying to do, and we can be assist we can assist in that mission and, and the things. And I said, a good idea is a good idea. Uh, Y'all should bring us into the fold, um, inform us because nobody likes to be surprised. The community doesn't like to be surprised. Obviously. CRA board or city council doesn't like to be surprised, but uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, board member Herte, board member. Thank Paulson. you. And uh, I'm just, uh, I just want to clarify. So if this is a city project, why are we talking about it at the CRA meeting? I just wanted to, that's my, I, I, I can answer that. It's within the redevelopment area yeah. that'll impact our outcomes. Okay. And it is being led by uh, our director of economic opportunity, Javier Marin, and then we are a partner mm -hmm. in it. Um, so I, I do receive uh, and hear. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm. That's. I think that's where we're all coming as a surprise because when you first initially said it, I thought that we were using CRA funds and thought, wow, we haven't heard anything about this. But that makes that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. But I still think the message is. Let's let's know about anything that's going on in the CRA area, maybe in advance. I think that would be um, helpful. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, I 
I appreciate um, Ms. Moody and Mr. Drumgo for um, bringing this up. You, it's not, as you said, it's not directly um, something that's before us as a CRA board, so I appreciate the, the heads up. It does bring up a systemic issue at City Council, which we can talk about later, which is that RIPs are let and companies are chosen, and then by the time it comes to us for approval of the contract and the budget, a lot of promises have been made. Sometimes months or years have gone by and investments have been made, and it's nearly impossible for us to vote no. And somehow we've got to get, as City Council, get ahead of that. Um, <clears throat> there shouldn't be these long RP cycles, and we shouldn't be blindsided by things. And we'll have to have a charter discussion about that with the, with the City Council. Um, the other thing, though, is that um, um, th there's a lot of things happening in East Tampa, finally, thank goodness. Um, uh, you know, one of my criticisms of the EDC over the last four years is that they mostly subsidize out-of-state companies um, that promise to bring jobs, and most of them never bring the jobs that they promise. And, um, and so now they've started looking into East Tampa over the last year or two, and the complaint I'm getting from East Tampa is there are already organizations that are involved in making changes. We know we've had several um, uh, graduates of Tampa Bay Tech that have come before us recently who were fantastic entrepreneurs. Uh, we have the CDC, we have all, all kinds of groups in, in, um, in East Tampa. And <clears throat> the, the community is saying, why is it that, <clears throat> why is it the city or city council is giving money to another organization that is represented in downtown and so that they can then turn around and give the, that same money away to groups in East Tampa? And I don't think we should delegate that authority to somebody else, I think we should run ourselves and um, at sitting as city council, we're gonna have that decision maybe next week or later. But, um, but we need to take seri make serious decisions about economic development in the city. I know that Ms. Drumgo, uh, Ms. Moody, and um, Ms. Travis and others in that department know what they're doing. Um, we need to, we as city council, because we're out in the community all the time, we need to know what the, what the overall integrated strategy is and we need to be able to help with it. Um, I think it shouldn't, should not be run uh, should not be outsourced to an elitist organization in downtown. Thank you. I just don't know where to start with these comments that are coming uh, regarding an RFP. I, I, for one, publicly just want to say that you have to trust the staff that we've hired. Very capable. We just finished complimenting the amazing and qualified staff that we're bringing on board in positions. And so RFPs are um, public knowledge because they're on a system where people can figure these things out. When it's presented to us, um, I don't know if there's just special attention for ES, e East Tampa where they have private conversations where concerns are expressed. Uh, I, if that is the case, then they should come to the board and speak to us directly when they have concerns. This particular um, RFP was not a secret to me. I actually was aware of it on a small degree, not on a big scale. But I just want to express that there should be some confidence within our staff to bring things to us and they don't have to get our permission to do business as normal. We don't operate in a silo. Because you presented it today, that provides us with an opportunity to ask questions, not the meeting before the meeting. We need to know about it, and then you present it publicly to everyone else. That's not necessarily in all cases. It's a starting process. It's an RFP. And what happens after the RFP is important I do believe in equity and how that information is presented shouldn't be done in favors. So this RFP, when it closes on October 30th, what happens next? Do you address count, um, the board with information regarding this RFP particularly? There will be a, a, a public opening for the sealed bids, so they'll receive the sealed bids and there will be a public opening. Uh, we have a review committee that will review each bid. Mm -hmm. It's open to the community and then that's where the, uh, the consultant or contractor would be selected. Okay, great. Because this is a wonderful we'll opportunity for East Tampa to have manufacturing, live, work in a space that has been underdeveloped. Um, in terms of manufacturing, as if you take a drive down Columbus Drive, you can see that there are businesses that are closed. So I just think this is a wonderful opportunity. And the process is not over. It's just the beginning um, of the process with the RFP. Any comments on that, Mr. Drumgo? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. And I, and I do receive all the comments that we've mm -hmm. heard today. Um, and I just ask that, you know, each of you has been contacted by uh, Director Marin, um, 
and you know your aides are scheduling one-on-ones with him to hear about the activity for the economic opportunity uh, work group and so I just ask that you you know work through your aides to make sure that we get you on the calendar to spend that time to debrief you on these items because I think that you know some of you have scheduled meetings with us so that we can have these conversations as well uh, in a one-on-one -on -one basis but certainly receive the feedback and the comments so that we can make sure that we're briefing you all uh, on these items and then relative to this particular project again it is just a start to that process yeah. director moody is a representative on that um, particular selection committee on behalf of this body and so you know once we receive those proposals again it is public you all will have the opportunity to look at those as well and so um, we'll receive uh, again she'll receive the comments and be able to provide feedback um, on that process as well so again she's your representative uh, amongst that group and she'll be able to weigh in relative to how uh, the particular project will impact the ultimate redevelopment plan for East Tampa and I will say that just because we issued an RFP doesn't mean we have to award it as you all know if it doesn't necessarily fit the criteria of what have been spelled out and, and the, the importance to the uh, particular area is not robust enough uh, as we seek then we can certainly opt not to award that okay Board Member Vieira and then Board Member Hertek. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And yeah, and I, and I wanted to point out something that Board Member Hertek said, it, and I don't want to uh, misquote her, but given the absence, the apparent absence of CRA dollars, right, it, it, we, we are being briefed on it, and I would suggest that does provide the requisite notice that that is being sought here, given the absence of CRA dollars. The councilwoman who directly represents the district appears to know about this, and this to me is the requisite notice that, that is being uh, requested, given the absence of CRA dollars. My position on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, this, this is a city RFP. There are no mm -hmm. CRA assets um, involved in it, and that's why it's going through the city process. If, there were, if this was property that was acquired with CRA, CRA dollars or CRA assets were involved in it, then yes, the RFP would have been brought before you before mm -hmm. it was issued. So, Is it because it's a certain dollar amount or it no. just any RFP will be presented to if the, us if the, if first? The, if okay. Under the policy, if there are CRA assets of this land that we mm -hmm. acquired with CRA dollars that's been, being put out, then that comes back to you all before this RFP is issued. Okay. So. Does that happen? And then you come to the meeting and tell us? Because no. that's what I'm hearing. No, 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 no. You no. can bring it to us for the first time. No. We can hear it publicly no, for the, the first idea time. Is that, the idea is that if there are CRA assets involved, mm -hmm. that before the RFP is issued, the draft RFP and the discussion about putting it out will okay. be brought before you first. That is that is how the process is supposed to okay. work. Okay, I just want to make sure you yeah. all get to do your jobs, but no problem. Board member Hurtek. Thank you. Um, the issue is more systemic. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of what uh, board member Carlson said. It's the mm -hmm. idea of uh, an RFP would come out and we wouldn't know about it until it came in front of us and it would be really hard to say no. And it was something that we wouldn't know about necessarily. So we're just looking for some more transparency as some of this happens. I'm not trying to stop our fabulous staff from doing the work they do, okay. but oftentimes seven of us in our districts and our areas, we also have input um, that I consider really important for some of these big RFPs that are so critical to the community. I mean, if I had had a community member, I mean, I vaguely think I've heard a little bit about this, but more just about the district in general. And so I just wouldn't want to be caught unaware anywhere in the city of not knowing about what something's um, coming forward. Uh, that's never a good look. And so I know we're working on those processes. And so I just want to say that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to having that conversation because I know the goal is to be open and transparent. So thank you. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, it, it, this is a, a systemic issue that, mm -hmm. that relates to the, the city and city council. And I know this administration has been trying to fix some of the communication. But an, an example, there are a lot of examples we could give you for the last few years, but an example would be if the city decided to sell a piece of property and didn't tell us, and the first we hear about it, we get a call from a reporter because an RFP has been filed. And unless we're watching the RFP listings, we might not see it, but we get a call from a report. We have no idea that it is even happening because nobody's briefed us on it. Nobody's asked our opinion. And then, or, the, or the, the other possibility is that we never hear about it. And suddenly at the very end, um, the city decides to award it to somebody for a certain price. And suddenly we have 100 people protesting and we didn't even know that it was happening. And so uh, one is to, is to give, my recommendation is for the city to give Council and the CRA board just a courtesy of 
asking for input on what they're going to do in the first place. Like we're going to talk about selling the police uh, headquarters today. If they decided to sell the police headquarters and they didn't even ask our opinion, mm -hmm. that then it creates a problem because if we can only give input at the very end, companies spend a lot of money uh, responding to RFPs and it's not fair to them to reject the idea outright. We might disagree with the idea in the beginning, but we're only asked to give input when we have to approve the contract and the money. And so what, what they really need to do is come to us either formally or informally at the very beginning and say, what's your idea on this? I, I suggest a minute ago the, the integrated strategy for economic development in Tampa and the integrated strategy for economic development in East Tampa. What is it? How does this piece fit in? What are all the different moving parts? I know that these folks are very, uh, very well-educated experts on how to do that, and I trust their opinion. But when there are pieces that, that um, could potentially blindside us, it's better to get, give us a heads up and ask our input be way before it even goes to RIP. That's not required by charter. But otherwise, we're the bad people that are re rejecting it at the very end, or we feel like we're forced to approve it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, in this process, the RFP is, a, once it's done, um, when it closes October 30th, it's still an open process that we still can reject. We have that opportunity even after the RFP is yeah, just to, over Yeah, just with. to clarify, yeah. and I understand uh, Mr. Carlson's point, Okay. but there no con the city cannot enter into any contracts Without whatsoever us. unless you all approve it right. as, as city council. None. Exactly. Zero zip. That's what I thought. Okay. 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 Yes. Well, yes. Good discussion. Let's keep yeah, going. I, I mean, Board member um, Clendenin and, and then Carlson. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I think what Carl, Councilman Carlson is saying Don't speak is. Speak for it, him. He can speak well, no, for but himself. I, because I, I, because Don't he, speak for he's him. echoing. I'll speak for anybody else want to there. Okay. Do what you want. <laughs> We're out of order. Go We're ahead. Out of order. Um, I, I think that I think again, this it goes down to what he what he was saying was that if you go down this path again, just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. And you go down this path, it creates a much more untenable situation at the end if you don't have if you don't have that on the front end. So you create a situation that becomes much more difficult to unwind. You know, once one or once the bullets out of the chamber, the bullets out of the chamber, you can't put it back. So I think that's what he's saying. Let's before we fire the gun. Let's get everybody on board. You know, little courtesy notices. I mean, you had that courtesy notice, obviously. So you are aware, but some of the rest of us didn't. Mm -hmm. So, but, and, and maybe it's not even just this issue. I think it's on, I, I don't even want to talk about this issue because obviously it sounds like a great idea. And if, yeah. if I've been brought up, then it's going, yeah, two thumbs up, sounds good to me. But I think okay. for future reference on other ideas as they come before, um, you know, come in front of the city, I think some courtesy notifications so that we are not surprised. Nobody likes to be surprised. Nobody okay. likes to be surprised. Well, it is my district, and I was not surprised, for the record. It's my district, and I was not surprised. Uh, and I don't like reading the book report for the student before the due date. You know, that's not how things work. Sometimes let the staff do their job and then present it, and that's what's happening today. But, you know, we can agree to disagree on that. I just um, don't hear any contention here. You presented it, and I appreciate it in that manner. So. Board member Carlson um, can go after because Mr. Miranda, you want to speak on this? No, no, okay. no. I'm just, just board here. member Carlson. I was just here listening to the conversation okay. and I'm just asking myself a question. Raise your hand, board members or council members today, if you think you heard every RFP that goes out by the city before it comes to us. Yeah. Raise your hand. Yeah, we don't have to change that. We need to let staff do their job. Thank you. That's my point. And then we get to make the decisions, like um, Attorney Mars said. We can shut down anything that we are, you know, that comes before us. But we need to, we need to be open to allowing our efficient staff to do their jobs. And so I don't want to operate um, in a manner where they have to get our permission first to present things to us. It just doesn't work that well. You, this is like the teacher level for me. And so we have an opportunity today to have the discussion. I don't want to beat a dead dog, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. No, yeah, no. Mr. Carlson, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, I, it, it, the, the, if the, if, if a staff person is buying pins or chairs or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't, or, or regular services, if we're repairing a pipe, that's fine. But when there's a new program, especially one that's expensive, imagine if, um, the, the, uh, there are all kinds of examples of things that have happened in the last few years where we were not given any input on it. And I think it's a, if there's some big new initiative, 
uh, and this is an example, I don't know the cost of it, but it's a new idea, a new initiative, it would be a good idea for staff to give us a heads up and get our input. It would be good for the administration because that would avoid us voting it down the end. If we wait, Mr. Morris is correct, we have the power to reject the budget, we have the power to reject the contract, but if, if you put on RP and five companies spend $100,000 each preparing for the RP, and then we reject the whole idea of the RP because we didn't like the idea in the first place, then that wasted all those companies' time, so that wasted the city's time. It would be better for somebody to give us a heads up in the beginning. In this case, we'd probably say that's a great idea, yeah. high Do five. Do we historically reject RFPs? Yeah. Yeah. We have. Yeah. I'm just asking questions. Just, just a couple things yeah. real quickly. This is a discussion really, a discussion. and we're going to have you're going to have a workshop on the CCNA mm -hmm. process and the RFP process in November. Okay. It's really a conversation for you all as council members, not really as the CRA. Okay. The, uh, your, 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 your jurisdiction here is rather limited. You're talking about issues that really are city council issues. Okay. So it may be better to, to after you, you know, to move on. Okay, so we'll close up with board member Clinton. And I'm gonna beat this dog with one, <laughs> one more stick, this dead dog. Uh, and it's in reference to Councilman Miranda's point is that I think the issue on, on this is not, you're right, there's, a, there's an awful lot of RPs with normal operation of the city, but obviously we're spending a really a huge amount of money on housing and affordable housing. This is the number one issue that people talk about in the city of Tampa. So something that is that encompasses the biggest big issue. I mean, I think housing, workforce development, I mean, this is one of those things that rise, that, you know, that it rises to the top of, of our agenda uh, of the city. And I think that's what sets it apart from purchasing paper and purchasing pens and you know fixing air conditioners and you know the basic stuff this is a this is a big agenda item for the city of tampa and i i think that's that's the difference that's why it's different than every other type of rfp because oh my god how many tens and tens of millions of dollars are we spending on housing so that was it okay last comment let's go continue let's go. sorry well, thank you so much for, for your comments. I definitely receive um, and hear them. I think it was a very interesting discussion that brought it into more of a, of a systems. Um, it sounds like we'll have a workshop to focus on, on the CCNA process, mm -hmm. and then I will work uh, alongside purchasing to see how this workflow it, uh, goes and develop a, a, a workflow chart and see where there's opportunities for board input, community input. So this, this is the perfect example of taking things apart, putting them back together. So I did appreciate everyone participating in the, in the discussion, um, and I am happy that you know about this RFP now. Uh, it is uh, live work. It's focusing on 50 to 80 percent AMI. So uh, we hope you are uh, in agreement of it. Uh, but it def definitely um, ha opens up a big discussion about how RFP should be handled moving forward on a citywide level as well as a CRA level. So uh, thank you for participating in that. Yeah. You know, uh, well, I'm about to get into something else. Uh, and, and this is where, you know, our transparency, where we can talk to each other and collaborate. Um, because of the sunshine, this is really where we can work through some of the items as a team. Um, and with that, I wanted to add more transparency around uh, two properties that the community has been asking about and has been interested in, uh, and just wanted to give an update on the Destination Church property, as well as the 22nd Street redevelopment of, of what's known as the Gator Building. Mm -hmm. I know the community is very interested in it, what is going on, and I just wanted to provide an update on that. And those will turn into RFPs, of which we'll take the feedback today and, and use this for the, the CRA-specific RFPs moving forward. So um, we've think I figured out what we, what we need. Uh, so the Destination Church property, that is uh, 1102 East Curtis Street, uh, Osborne Avenue, and um, so there's four different parcels there. We closed on the property on September 1st, 2023. So it does take time from when it gets approved by the board to do the acquisition. So we did just close on the property, property recently on September 1st, 2023. So our next step with that is to do environmental testing. Uh, and if there's potential remediation that needs to take place, the next step would be remediation and then moving into demolition of the existing structures on site. Uh, so that goes for both properties, the Destination Church site, as well as the 22nd Street redevelopment of the Gator Building. So we are working towards environmental testing and then we'll do demolition at the same time. They'll be able to mobilize and do both of these properties. And I really look forward to the community being able to like see some construction happening. Uh, so we look forward to that and those will be turned into RFPs of which we will definitely engage the board and move those important projects forward in East Tampa. Uh, so thank you. I just pr wanted to provide a quick update on that. Uh, okay, any questions? So just a clarification, yes. Um, mm -hmm. 
is this an instance for this particular board where now they need to bring the RFP to us? Is this one of those examples? Okay, so they mm -hmm. presented it, so there should be no surprise when the RFP comes, right? Okay. That was good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. In, in participating in that process. Okay. And, and just a note on the RFP process, I've been learning it um, as I've been here. It, it, it does take about six to eight months mm -hmm. uh, for RFP to be developed, posted for, for posted for at least 30 days, the opening bid, the selection committee. So it, it takes a while. Um, and if we do build in more input and processes, which is great, just understanding that it, it'll, it'll take uh, add a couple months to the mix, but it does take about six to eight months to get an RFP out there and off the ground. So that's why projects take you know a while to get done. Uh, so we're looking to expedite these processes, and I think creating a workflow will will help with that, with timelines and deliverables throughout the way. Um, so yes, we're really excited about those projects. Any other questions? Um, I'm going to move into talking about the CAC policy update specifically to East Tampa. Um, yep, we ready for it? Yeah. So uh, this has been a continuous discussion uh, for at least the last two years, and I do, I do hear the community when they come out and, and provide their input and engagement, and you know, the, the thing about CRAs is that the community advisory committees are foundational to a community redevelopment agency existing. Uh, it's built into the statute, so the CACs are very, very important, and uh, what I love about it is it allows opportunity for these projects to come from within the community and take fruition uh, on this level. So really transforming communities from the inside out. So CACs are like the backbone uh, of what we do. So I, I do appreciate everyone reaching out, sharing this. I look forward to connecting with residents one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but, but what I did here was uh, that they, they want all 11 active neighborhood associations to have a seat. Uh, so I hear that, and what I would like to recommend is amending the CAC policy so the, all 11 active neighborhood associations do have a seat. And the way that we can do that is by reducing the East Partner or the East Tampa Revitalization Partnership from two seats to one and increasing the neighborhood associations from 10 seats to 11. So I would like to make that recommendation uh, to the board and I think that's a good compromise where we can have all of the neighborhood associations represented, uh, still have uh, the partnership on board and then also opportunities for uh, at large participants. Board Member Clinton and Board Member Hurtay. So I make a motion to uh, change the CAC composition of East Tampa CAC from <laughs> 10 to 11 and reduce the uh, partnership from uh, 2 to 1. Okay, we have a motion and a second by Board Member um, Maniscalco. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Board Member Hurtay. Um, I, thank you for this. Uh, I appreciate that you've uh, heard the community and wanted to. Uh, um, when we talked, we had uh, we had just talked about possibly just expanding the board overall. Is there a rationale for just reducing that seat to one? So um, no. So with that, we wanted all of the eleven active neighborhood associations to have a seat, mm -hmm. uh, and what that does is, in a way to do that is reducing the partnership to one and still keeping it at that fifteen max. Mm -hmm. And then what we would the like. Max is what is limiting it. The, the mm -hmm. number is why they're recommending a reduction of one. There's yes. A um, so however, I just wanted to make a yeah. point that we ignored that rule and we let did. Ebor we did. have that. So I just, we voted. but that, well, but we did vote for that. And so that's the only reason I'm bringing it up is mm -hmm. because we gave, we gave that um, accommodation to Ebor yeah. and I'm not sure why we wouldn't give the same accommodation to East Tampa. If I could just repeat what I'm hearing. So what I'm hearing is that any active neighborhood association has a seat and we keep two seats for the partnership, one for Tampa CDC and two at large. And then as we do an annual uh, review of the update when the term, if there's additional active neighborhood associations, then they would get a seat. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, well and, and we can revisit it too, um, as we pretty much have to uh, yearly. Um, I'm, just, I'm just saying that I'm okay with with limiting and doing all of that, but I wanted to have the conversation because yeah. we did have the conversation with Ebor, and I just thought it was fair, um, Mr. Drumgo. If, if, if I may, uh, just for the record, you know, uh, uh, my apologies, at least Drumgo, Deputy Administrator. So, in, in hearing this conversation too, just keep in mind that the bylaws and policies hadn't been updated for, you know, some 15 years before we just made these changes. And as a board, you all select the ex officio organizations 
throughout the CRA, right, that are representative of particular neighborhoods or business groups. You are more than welcome to open up that discussion at any given time to revise those numbers or those assignments. And so um, as, as we are making this compromise today, we understand that there are 11 active neighborhood associations. There are others in East Tampa that will ultimately come online as well, but none of this prevents those, those neighborhoods from showing up to a meeting. I think this is a, a matter of how the CACs operate overall, right? I walk into meetings as a subject matter expert and they tell me to sit in the corner until they call me to the microphone. And so, you know, the way that the business is conducted is the thing that needs to change. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily yeah. your policy. And so when people show up to make comments or they have things that they're bringing to the uh, CAC, it, there should be an open forum to have those discussions, even if it, you know, it from a comment perspective, the, that particular CAC may not want to hear it. So mm -hmm. I do think that that representation of the neighborhoods can occur in, you know, where folks can show up because they know that they're a part, they're ultimately going to be a part of this process. And keep in mind that this is a transition year in which we are not able to accommodate every single neighborhood association because we wanted to allow some of those folks to continue to serve their terms as the partnership, right? We could have wiped the slate completely clean or you could have wiped the slate clean and then nominated or appointed a, a, full, uh, a full body, right? But that was not done. So I think some of the pains that we're experiencing are really growing pains that are associated with the change. And I would say that, you know, maybe two years from now, uh, this conversation will be completely different. And you've heard Director Moody say that she's, she's about to go on a speaking campaign to yeah. convey these changes. And so I, I think over the next few months, you'll start to see more comprehension of this. And ideally, that the pressure goes back to the CAC to change how they do business. Yes, and I, I appreciate that. And I think a lot of what the drama has been is this one year. And so when I talked to you, Ms. Moody, um, at my briefing, I thought I talked about the idea of uh, the, the neighborhoods that aren't, that didn't, uh, um, that, that weren't chosen in the lottery, mm -hmm. that they have the ability to speak on each item, mm -hmm. whereas the general public would not. And I think for that one year, that they have the ability that, that others generally don't, and that we don't allow in general, that if we allow those neighborhood associations to speak on each item, Sort of, sort of like what we do in a workshop here. I think it would, it would, it would help foster um, the trust that we're trying to develop and and smooth it over into the full year that we will start at the beginning of fiscal year 2025. Okay, Board Member Carlson. Yeah, thank you. This is not an easy task, and and uh, you know the case just for anybody watching for the first time. This the case of Ebor and East Tampa are different than the others because mm -hmm. of the way they were structured in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you to my colleagues for agreeing to a, a slightly modified version for Ebor because that allowed us to avoid a lot of yeah. arguments in the community. Um, in, the, in, the, in the case of this, um, I, I like the idea of keeping the East Tampa partnership at one because we're, we're, we're allowing those terms to, to go continue on but the East Tampa Partnership then would have a seat along with, uh, I mean, we're, there's still gonna be a seat for them. And, yeah. they, and there are a lot of organizations that would, that would like seats like that. And so uh, to be fair to all the other organizations, one seat is fine to me. Um, the, the big thing that we're missing from my point of view is business people. Um, it could be that some of the neighborhood leaders are also businesses, but we see um, uh, a lot of emerging focus on small businesses, which is what I think is essential um, for our entire community. Uh, and um, and we're, but we don't have business representation like in Ebor. They have sector representation. Um, I'm not going to push for that right now. But as you said, when we talked, uh, we can monitor it and then and then maybe change it next year if we want. But we need to make sure that that business and and I mean businesses based in in that district would. Um, probably should have a seat at the table at some point. Um, in terms of potentially having more people, I'm okay with that if we add business people in the future, but the other thing is um, a, a hybrid that I just thought of as we were, as we were discussing this is um, we could have all um, 11 neighborhood leaders, the East Tampa Partnership, and then just have those seven folks um, 
only fill out their terms. So you would have more than the official number just for that period, six months or a year until their term runs out. And then those seven seats would disappear. That way the, the neighborhoods could go ahead and have a, a seat and then we wouldn't break the overall rule of having more people yet. It would just be on a temporary basis. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Thank you for your work on this. Um, you listened to the community, came back, made the changes. That's what collaboration is all about, so I appreciate the work. We have a motion by Board Member Clendenin, second by Board Member Maniscalco. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries for the changes. Okay. Thank you very much. I know these are tough. <clears throat> okay, I'll wrap it up. Uh, community yeah. redevelopment plan updates are currently underway. We have four, um, Tampa Heights, Central Park, East Tampa, and downtown. So as you know, uh, we are updating the downtown. We're having conversations about potentially capping the, the TIF for downtown. Uh, so every one of the board members should receive an invite for a one-on-one -on -one with the downtown uh, yeah. consultant. And uh, that is the opportunity to provide your priorities for downtown, engage, fold it into the plan, and they will be coming back in December. Um, I wanted to mention uh, during this during this section is that as an agency we're, we're bound by the redevelopment plans mm -hmm. so as developers or partners come to part to partner with us it has to be in the plan um, and that's where we need to really hold strong on it if it's not in the plan uh, it 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 really can't happen. So that is why these redevelopment plans are so important. And essentially, these projects should be coming straight from the plans uh, into fruition. So we're happy that people want to reach out and partner with us, but it's just so important that we hold our line, that it has to be in compliance with state statute, our community redevelopment plan, and of course, our budgetary uh, constraints. So uh, we're really excited for these. These are part of the restructure as well. Four out of eight districts is a big deal, uh, East Tampa being one of them, and we'll open, uh, we'll invite the community to participate in that RFP process as well. So just wanted to reiter reiterate that all those are in motion. Uh, the board will be engaging with our downtown consultant and we'll have a great discussion come December. Okay, um, I am looking for a motion. We have the Ebor CRA is receiving recognition for the completion of their iconic 7th uh, Archway Ave Lights. Uh, the two different organizations are recognizing the Ebor CRA, so uh, I would like to invite the board to um, invite them at our next meeting on November 9th to come and present said award. Okay, we have a, okay, we have a motion um, to invite them on November what date? November 9th. November 9th, okay. Second by Board Member Clendenin. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Great. <clears throat> Last couple items. Uh, we did have a grand reopening of the Open Cafe uh, in East Tampa on Sunday, October 8th. Mm -hmm. uh, that was done after their church ceremony. I know a few board members were present. Just wanted to thank you for participating. Uh, the cafe is beautiful and is going to be such a, a positive impact for the East Tampa community. So uh, congratulations to Open Cafe and um, just wanted to celebrate that for a moment. Yeah. We also have the Health Matters Wellness Hub. Uh, this is a grant that was provided to uh, the Wellness Hub and they've completed it uh, from 2022 to 2023. So they will be hosting their grand opening on October 16th at 10 a.m. And that is at the Wellness Hub. Uh, so we definitely wanna recognize some of these great projects going on in East Tampa and, and we just appreciate our board for participating. Um, lastly, just wanted to thank you, thank everyone who's been a part of this. Uh, I did recently speak on a panel for the Urban Land Institute on creative placemaking and urban design, uh, and I was just so honored to stand up there representing the city of Tampa and the Community Redevelopment Agency. Uh, so just thank you for this opportunity again, and I look forward to working with you, the community, and all of our great partners. So uh, just wanted to thank you, and that is the end of the director's report. Okay. Um, can you speak on that wellness um, hub? What is October 16th? It is, yes, Monday, October 16th at okay. 10 a.m., this was a standalone grant for an interior uh, repair and renovation. Okay. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, um, to the speech you said, if there's a video, please send it to us so we can see it too. Also, would love to see what you're saying. Um, uh, also, um, I forgot to mention when we were talking about the East Tampa partnership, one of my concerns is that the this, this city and the CRA uh, disassociate ourselves from the election in the future for the East Tampa partnership. And mm -hmm. I just wanted the public to know that um, Erica told me that um, that a letter from the chair has gone 
uh, to the partnership, and there are, there's other documentation to say that the CRA is not involved in that election going forward. So mm -hmm. whatever happens in the future is up to the board of the East Tampa Partnership. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Director's report concluded. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the Stras report. Thank you for your patience. Welcome. This is item number um, seven on the agenda being moved up. Thank you so much. You have two minutes. I'm just I, <laughs> I work in showbiz. You think I'd have, I would have been ready for that, don't you? Hi, uh, good, morning. good morning. I'm Greg Holland. I'm the president and CEO of the Stras Center. Thank you, Chairwoman Henderson. Thank you, board members, for having us here today. I also want to thank the CRA staff. I want to thank city staff uh, for, for being here today. I also wanted to tell you that we have several board of trustees in, in uh, attendance today, including former board chair Gary Sasso and master plan uh, committee chair uh, David Schur. Um, so here, I'm here today to, to bring you up to speed on the Stratus Center Master Plan progress. Um, October is my one year anniversary in Tampa and my one year anniversary uh, at the Stratus Center. And I, you know, I've been reflecting, why, why did I come to the Stratus Center? And I, you know, I, th I think about those early realizations that the Stratus Center is one of the top 10 performing arts centers in the United States. We're the largest cultural institution in the Southeast United States. We're an anchor institution on the Riverwalk. But the real opportunity here was to look at how the Stras, as a city building an asset, continues building and growing to meet the needs of our education, community service, and this growing city. And it's an exciting place to be. You know, when I first got here, we started pricing, doing initial pricing on the construction. We got those numbers at the end of last year. The beginning of this year, we looked at those much larger numbers, thanks to inflation, thanks to supply chain issues, and we realized we needed to go through a design realignment process. So we began that process. And rather than being arduous and difficult, it was transformational. We came up with new opportunities. It was better than we could have ever imagined. We took the additional time to price and design construction based on these increased numbers, based on the fact that bridge financing interest is going up. You know, the Stras Center is always a steward of private and public funding, and we're taking the time to ensure that this project is financially secure. So what am I doing today? Today I'm going to talk about the goals and the impact of the Stras Center and the master plan. I'm going to talk a little bit more about why we're here today, and then I'll give you a progress update on our fundraising and our construction. You've seen these goals, this first slide are goals. I'm not going to read them to you, but these really keep the Stras Center focused on the fact that the performing arts support the city's vibrant growth and bright future. Again, the Stras Center is owned by the city and is one of its key community assets. These goals support the city's plan to drive economic development, increase opportunities for all Tempanians, contribute to our diverse and vibrant neighborhoods, enhance infrastructure, and support the overall community growth. But when we talk about this partnership with the CRA, the city, and the Stras Center, we really are saying one thing. We're here to elevate Tampa. In the 1980s, city and community leaders came together in a 50-50 public-private partnership to conceive of what's now the Stras Center and then to build it. And this was to help make Tampa a great city with a wonderful quality of life. We're confident that this new investment in Tampa's Performing Arts Center will bolster our impact on the entire city. So now I'm going to go over quickly a few slides that talk about the impact. Mm -hmm. Today, our mission and vision are also our promise to the community. Together, 
our investment, this new investment in the Stras will strengthen the central business district through expanded event spending, increased community benefits, new administer, uh, amenities, and workforce development. When the plan is completed and we look at this, we expect a minimal 20% increase in all of these numbers. And in fact, soon when construction starts, hundreds of people will be hired to work in construction, planning, and, and space work. The Stratton Center, of course, is a community service organization. We always have exciting programs that provide opportunities for so many to benefit from the performing arts. You know about our Stras Salutes initiative, and that's an initiative that focuses on military veterans and their families and provides services through interactive arts activities, dialogue, and dedicated resources. From that came our arts and healing program. We're also nationally known for that. And working with Johns Hopkins Universities and others, we have a prescriptive arts programs. Our arts education, events and programs serve over 50,000 kindergarten through 12th graders annually. And we've long worked with schools, community centers and shelters to improve learning and understanding through the arts. In fact, we project with the completion of the master plan, these numbers and these programs will increase by 30%. Finally, our impact as a riverfront destination. On the riverfront, the Stras Center is an anchor institution for the community. The Stras Center makes the river walk a place that artists can work and audiences can attend shows in a unique, beautiful setting. And all of that occurs free of charge. In addition to expanding cultural and educational institution, this master plan will grow our position on the Riverwalk and create new community gathering spaces open to all citizenry. In fact, the Stras Center has really been a pioneer on the Riverwalk. We already do performances on our stage there. Last Friday, we started our Latin music. Uh, we had our first Latin music night as part of Arts Remix. And Arts Remix, every month, brings hundreds of family members, people on date nights, and boats up to the shore to attend these events. And with the master plan completion, we see all of this growing. So we do have a request for you today. With our goals and impacts as background, and before I go into our progress, as I've said, we've successfully worked through a design realignment process to fit the project into this $100 million budget, and it's been hugely successful. Staying inside this budget and using our funds responsibly takes time. All we are seeking from CRA board today is more time to finalize pricing for financing in this tough economic climate and additional time to complete pricing construction so we go in with the best pricing and the best bridge financing. When granted, this additional time will allow for a new five-year funding schedule for the CRA's support of the master plan. We are seeking that the contract a precedent satisfaction date be modified from December 1, 2023 to December 1, 2024 to allow us the time needed to finalize pricing and financing in a more favorable economic environment. Our commitment and your commitment to this transformative project, the project design and its now realignment, and private and public fundraising has never wavered. We have already completed key components of the conditions precedent, and over the next several months, we will complete all of the conditions precedent. So let me give you an update. First, the fundraising plan. Again, a $100 million budget, $80 million of it for construction, $20 million for an endowment raise. One of the conditions precedent is that the Stras Center matches the $25 million CRA funding, and we've done that. In fact, we have confirmed signed commitments for $27,500,000. So we've matched and overmatched the CRA funds. 
We have another $4 million in verbal intentions, which I've learned in my first year in nonprofit means. We're getting ready to have those sign, signed as, as donor contracts as well. So to date, confirmed, we have $56.5 million for construction for that $80 million in construction. I should also say we've raised almost $8 million toward our $20 million goal for endowment. The fundraising plan is the backbone of our strategy. As you know, we have a large, committed, voluntary board of trustees who are out on our behalf raising money and successfully doing it every day. I'm going to move into timeline. This is the biggest question. So currently, I'm going to give you some highlights. Currently, we're finalizing design development. In fact, we've, we've gone through our design realignment process. You'll see that next summer, we'll have finalized pricing. We'll move to permitting. Permitting is one of the conditions precedent. And with that permitting going into the fall of 24, with this extension when granted, we will start construction in fall of 24. We're still on target with this timeline to be complete at the end of 2026, we'll move in and we'll have our grand opening in 2027. In closing, we want to thank you for partnering with us on this transformative project. Please remember, we're not asking for additional funding. We're only asking for a modified time on this contract to give us time in a more favorable economic environment to finish the bidding process on construction and find better bridge loan rates. Together, this boundless effort will lift Tampa's cultural reputation, our region's economy, certainly our children's educational access, and our community's quality of life. Thank you. Thank Are there you. questions today? Yes, Board Member Hurtick. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for this presentation and also thank you uh, for doing the work to go back to the drawing board and redesigning instead of simply just coming and asking for more money. I think uh, that is the, the ethos that the city is looking at right now. What can we do with the money we have? And so I really want to say thank you for that. But I also see that you're not planning on cutting anything you're just moving the money in different ways to still have as much impact as possible and i just want to say thank you thank you for all you've done here and um, all you'll continue to do um, you and i spoke about how much i appreciate your attention to the local artists and um, our black box theater at the Stras. Um, my husband's a board member and we have been supportive for many, many years. And uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to see more attention to the, to the smaller local um, projects. So thank you again for that. And I appreciate your presentation today. Board Member Maniscalco, followed by Board Member Clint Bittman. Thank you. Thank you very much. You used a word that, that stood out and that was unwavering. And that's uh, your commitment to this project and working with the other partners, us as a CRA. Uh, you have private donations, whether verbal or, or written commitments. Uh, I know we're going to get to the goal. Uh, I have absolute confidence in that because we realize the importance of the Strass Center and the impact it makes on this community. Um, I want to, again, echo what Councilwoman Hertak said. Um, you are uh, not just coming to us for more money. You're looking at different options. You're being responsible. The board is being responsible. The trustees all the way down. And I think that's the right approach considering the magnitude of this not just from what it's going to cost, but the impact that it's going to make for generations. So um, very good presentation. Thank you for the, the clarity. Um, and uh, I'm happy to approve this once we, we come to a vote. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, I already recognized you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to be yelled at. I wouldn't yell at you. <laughs> She's a former school teacher. She yells at me all the time. I, I'm used to it. I, That's why I, she's so I, good at this. I, I, I spent 12 years in public school getting yelled at by school teachers, and now. <laughs> because he has attention seeking behavior. <laughs> For that, the record. That's a fact. Um, that, that is a fact. Guilty. Guilty as charged. But he's my freshman brother. So, um, well, you know, I, I just want to emphasize, you know, when we, when we talk about these types of uh, investments, that 
these are kind of the projects that we have, we have a return on the investment for the community. And you know, I, I, I've been a, was a Strata supporter when it was first proposed as a resident of the city of Tampa. I think it's a crown jewel for the city. It's a city-owned asset. And you know, some of the, you know, it's, 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 it's showing its age, you know, unlike me, who's internally youthful. <laughs> uh, the Strata, the, the, the Strata's attention-seeking behavior. Um, the Strata's is showing its age and it needs a little bit of love and attention. And I think what y'all are doing is really uh, bringing forth some of its best qualities, doubling down on the school aspect of it, uh, for you know, with the education. I think which and I had the opportunity to, to tour, which was incredible, and seeing the students and you know what's happening in the stress. I think a lot of people maybe not realize your educational component. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to to approve this I extension. In fact, if we're ready, I'll make the motion to. to well, do well that board, one. board member Miranda wants to speak if that's okay, and then I'll speak. No, that's fine. Or yeah. yeah that's, you can make a motion. I mean, okay. I don't okay. Know. So I'll make a motion to approve the uh, the extension to December first, twenty twenty four. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank you. I had never had the pleasure of meeting you. We've both been kind of busy, and uh, I can tell you that uh, the Strands is a lot uh, more than what people just think of. When everything went to H E double hockey sticks at, in Tampa some years ago, back in two thousand eight, about two thousand fourteen or so. When we had a layoff 700 and some people, the Strand was open. And when you look at downtown, it was not too many things there when it first built. In fact, it goes back to the, I believe, when Bob Martinez was mayor and then became governor. And I'm not going to go into the whole history of it because it's really amazing what uh, Mayor Martinez had done. He had some friends when the public said, nah, we don't think you like the idea right now. And they got some friends, and that was the opening of the Strath as we know it now. So a lot of it goes to Governor Martinez, who was really mayor at that time when it happened in Tampa, so the kudos should go to him. He's the one that said, no, we're going to build it. And uh, all that and set in mind, the program that you have for all citizens to participate in is amazing. And uh, gratitude to Judy Lisi and some of the board members that I had the pleasure of serving with 102 years ago. It means a lot to us. I wasn't, not, not to my cousin over there, but uh, it's amazing that they, they do the job that they do because they do it from the heart and they don't do it for any personal gain. They do it because they want success to happen. You can't have a downtown if there is no downtown. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, Tampa was a city that had a downtown that was vacant. Any city over 250,000 people that does not have a vibrant downtown is dying not making it. And thank God to all the people here that were with you today, ladies and gentlemen, that I know personally, and all those that served are the ones that serve the kudos to do what they've done. So that being said, I, I, I know the, the structure that you're in. I know the problems of financing going up. Is it going to go up again another half a point or a point or whatever? And I hope it doesn't right now, but you never can tell. So I'll be supporting the motion that was brought in by my Council Member uh, Clendenin. Thank you, Board Thank Member. Board Member Carlson. Um, I just, uh, a few things. Thank you to you and your board for the vision and thanks to Judy Lisi also for pushing this before she left and um, look forward to you putting your touch on it and, and implementing it. Um, I just want to remind the public this is a city-owned facility and I think you said when it was originally created, it was a 50-50 match, public-private. In this case, if, you, if we're including the, the endowment, which is essential to make sure it's, it's uh, funded going forward, the city, the CRA is only putting in 25%. So um, I think the fact that the public is putting in a $75 million investment into a city-owned property, they're enhancing our property, we're only putting in 20, that's a pretty good deal. The dollar number is a lot, but the former philosophy was to subsidize real estate development. Now we're subsidizing essential um, uh, venues that can be used by people throughout the city. Um, none of the CRA districts are in my district, but my district goes to the Strath Center. And so now um, uh, my district, every other district in the city, um, same with New Tampa, everyone else can, can participate in it. Also, um, you talked about it being an economic engine. And it's not just that people go to dinner before and after. Um, I facilitate roundtables of IT and tech CEOs, and we know absolutely there's a connection between 
um, the tech community and investments in the arts. If you ask any um, company that hires software engineers, they say the number one major is not coding, it's um, music. And so the, the, the number one people that they hire, every tech CEO tells me this, uh, is, is a music major because it's easier to teach uh, musicians how to code than it is to teach coders about harmony. And uh, I just got back from with, a, with the Tampa Chamber um, in, um, in Boston and we saw the same thing there. You, it's not just that these high tech people want to uh, go attend a meeting, many of them are performers and musicians and, and artists that are participating in these things. Also, if your measure of success is real estate development, go try to walk around the stress center. Every inch around it is developed now. And some of it, I think, is going to be redeveloped. So it's, it's successful in drawing people and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and getting people to put in hotel uh, money and, and restaurants and others. Uh, but it's essential for the tech economy and the high-paying jobs that we're trying to, to recruit. It's essential for real estate. And then also, um, you don't have time to talk about it, but you have so many programs that reach out to disadvantaged people in the community and kids. And uh, part of the perception is that you have to pay a lot of money to go to the Strat Center. It's not true, especially with this design. You talked about free programming on the Riverwalk, free programming in other places. There's free um, uh, scholarships for kids to go to, to training programs. These kinds of things completely transform uh, people's lives. So thank you for what you're doing. Board thank Member you. Vieira. You. you can tell them if they want to learn about harmony, they can talk. Stop interrupting. Us. Oh, I know. Yeah, so Councilman Clendenin's talking about our, our City of Tampa Quartet, City Council yeah, Quartet, which, which <laughs> we're, other than this guy, we're pretty bad. But but I, I, I wanted to thank you all for your presentation. We spoke about a week ago, and, and you all are obviously gentlemen and gentle ladies, and you're uh, an outstanding gentleman, and I know you've done a great job and will continue to do a great job. Uh, and I told you all my position in, in our meeting, which is I originally voted against this. Uh, I, I have no problem supporting our cultural institutions through the CRA. Um, I, I supported the Tampa Theater recently, the uh, Tampa Museum of Art. Um, you know, my, my thinking for something of this nature would be uh, what, what appeared to be, again, I wasn't present at the negotiations, but the original number of $15 million, therefore I voted against it. And I always like to be consistent on something like this, uh, especially as it appears that the, obviously the votes are going to pass for you all, and I wish you all the best in your endeavors because to the extent that the Strath Center uh, succeeds, obviously downtown succeeds and the city of Tampa succeeds, I just, again, as I said in my original comments some time ago uh, on this, I, I think when you take a look at our downtown, number one, there's uh, the, the, not to relitigate issues, but you go into the, the discussion on capping of the downtown CRA, et cetera, and the other investments that we can make in downtown. I thought a more measured approach should be uh, made in that regard. So I think it's important for me to be consistent, but, but again, acknowledging the amazing work that y'all do and what uh, gentlemen and gentle ladies y'all are. And I wish y'all and all of us the best in that regard. And also, you know, we've talked about some things that the uh, uh, Strath Center is going to continue to do on communities that we all care about and we're going to continue to have those discussions because uh, obviously we're all friends here because we're all keeping our eye on the same ball for Tampa. So I thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, board member. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, in wrapping this up, Mr. Holland, thank you so much for your presentation today. Congratulations on being with our, us for one year in your position. Um, and congratulations on the fundraising goal. You met that, exceeded it, $27.5 million. Initially, you know, I look at the Stras, I don't see slum and blight, so I was very concerned that we would spend $25 million on a beautiful facility. But I have come to the understanding, that's the beautiful part about having the conversation, um, why the motion was made to provide $25 million to improve this structure. Um, it is a city asset and it just, it does make sense. And that conversation definitely needed to be had with someone like me. It's in my district, of course. I live in the best district. <laughs> I am the councilwoman for the best district. And so um, there are boundless opportunities. It's in my district, too. Okay, congratulations, citywide. <laughs> um, the, the one thing, and I just want to say it publicly, we had this conversation when I met with you all, is to flex your muscle on that community uh, benefit agreement. Flex that muscle. Um, in a way where, you know, that engagement can occur and we provide some amazing opportunities that go even beyond our youth. So I really um, can't wait to hear um, some of the ideas and maybe even you be open to listening to some of the ideas that I'm coming up with. But um, congratulations. We're going to go ahead on and accept this motion from Alan Clendenin and seconded by Board Member Maniscalco. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Your motion? Okay. 
Okay. Motion Thank carries for the extension through December 2024. Attorney Morris. Thank uh, you. Just to clarify, there will be an amendment to the funding agreement that will come forward to you at the November meeting to um, yes, sir. codify what we they actually also. Okay, prepared. the actual real contract, right? Because this is contractual. Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Holland. Thank you so much. For okay. All right. So we are moving on. We have um, staff report from Tampa Bay Water. You have two minutes. <laughs> How many slides? Thank you so much. So many things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you want me to set this up while they're talking? If you, board member Carlson. Um, this was a <clears throat> this was a motion I made some time back and thank you all for supporting it. The idea here is that um, we need to conserve water. Water is the most valuable uh, resource that we have now and in the future. Um, Tampa, because they're part of Tampa Bay Water, does not have a water uh, shortage. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of water for the next 20 years at least and maybe the next 50 years. Uh, but still we need to look at to conserve. Um, every now and then Tampa buys from Tampa Bay Water as part of the wholesale agreement. Mm -hmm. Um, the city of Tampa net of um, net of conservation needs about four or five million gallons a day in 20 years, um, which we can easily buy from Tampa Bay Water. Uh, but by conserving water, we might be able to, um, with a low cost, uh, conserve enough that we won't need that water in the future. And so, um, if we can if we can reduce the uses of water, it's not only good environmentally, but it also um, helps renters who are paying for water um, directly or indirectly and it um, it will help um, our city in keeping our water costs down so t so swift mud and tampa bay water have a program and the idea here is can we as a cra board help them with some of the big uh, venues like um, big apartment complexes to help them enhance their existing programs so that we can save more water and hopefully prevent having to buy more water sources in the future thank you Thank you. This is a CRA staff report, right? We do have guests up okay. from Swift Mud, Tampa Bay Water, and the Water Department okay. here as well. Welcome. Yep. I'd like to invite our guests um, to come up and introduce yeah. themselves, and then I'll tee us up and pass it off. Okay. So uh, if you want to come up and introduce yourself and your position. Good morning, board. My name is Amelia Brown. I'm the Demand Management Program Manager at Tampa Bay Water. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. I'm Josh Madden. I'm with the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Hello, I'm Ryan Smith, the City of Tampa Water Department's Conservation and Efficiency Team. Great, and as you know, my name is Erica Moody, CRA Director, and we have reached out to uh, this wonderful team to see how we can uh, potentially partner and help with their, their efforts with the Tampa WaterWise program, which is a rebate program that we'll uh, learn about today. It's available to the public. You get money back when you make improvements. It's residential and uh, apartment complexes. So for the purpose of today, as Board Member Carlson said, we'll be focusing on uh, more of the multifamily apartment complexes. And they've pulled some great data within the community redevelopment areas, and we look forward to their presentation today. Uh, the motion, as, as we just spoke on, was for C CRA staff to report on, Tam uh, on Tampa Bay Water, uh, Swift Mud, the City Water Department, and looking into the feasibility of matching WISE funds for apartment buildings within CRA districts. Uh, so we're here today uh, to present the data and outline next steps for partnership. Madam Chair, could I just explain what this acronyms mean? Yes, you may, Board mean? Member Carlson. Swift, Swift Mud is a, is a uh, regional entity. How many counties do you all have? 10 or 12? Something? Uh, 16, Six, all are part of 16. So, the, so 16 counties, and they're the, the regulatory agency, so they issue water permits, water use permits, but they also fund uh, new water sources for municipalities and counties. Tampa Bay Water is a three-county, three-city, um, Hillsborough, Pinellas, Pasco, you have all that, mm -hmm. um, so that uh, it's, it's the wholesale water supplier. It has its own source of water that it supplies to its member governments, and then the city um, uses its own water sources, but also water sources from Tampa Bay Water, just so we can explain. Thank, thank you. you. Board Member Miranda. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm in reviewing this and just looking at the uh, uh, the ones that are apartment complex. Are those single metered or are they just one meter for the whole complex? Does anybody know? I don't know. I think Ryan might know. 
Some of them are single metered, some of them might have an irrigation meter or several meters, depending on the size of the complex. So then each, each apartment gets a, it's a separate meter? Oh, uh, I don't know if the apartments sub-meter within themselves. Yeah, because I'm, the reason I'm saying the public doesn't know, and I don't think we know either. They don't. They're not sub-meter. Sub so they, right. they've got one big sale, and then they just, how do they, we don't know, if, is the water bill included in the, in the payment of the rent, or is it just divided by so many apartments? I don't know. It, it depends. It depends on, on the apartment and the property manager and how they set up their rates. Um, so sometimes it is that, sometimes it's the individual meter and the payment. Yeah, great. Um, so we're going to jump into the presentation and then let's field all of the questions as we move forward. Sure. Um, so this is uh, providing some education on the program. We'll move into data and then start charting next steps. So I'm going to invite Amelia Brown to come and present. So thank, thank you. you. Good morning. So we talked a little bit about the fact that Tampa Bay Water provides uh, drinking water to these three counties, Pasco, Pinellas, Hillsboro, as well as the city of Tampa, St. Peter's and New St. Petersburg and Newport Ritchie. As such, these three cities, three counties, and Tampa Bay Water worked together about three years ago to develop, launch, and implement a regional water conservation program. This is an incentive-based rebate program, and we work together every month to uh, guide the development and implementation of this program across the region. The program, called Tampa Bay WaterWise, is also co-funded by the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And the ultimate goal of the program is to save water and save money. And I mean not only for the customers who participate in it and reduce their water use and get the rebate and save money, but for the water utilities in Tampa Bay Water, conservation is generally lower cost than developing new supplies. It is an important part of Tampa Bay Water's um, vision for the future. It is incorporated in our long-term master water plan. And as we all know, with the population increasing um, in the region, and particularly of late with the lack of rainfall, water demands are increasing across the region, and water efficiency is a key strategy. Our goal is to save up to 4 million gallons per day by 2030 through a variety of residential, multifamily, and commercial rebates. I'm going to describe to you just the multifamily rebates program to you today. So we have three main options. We have toilet rebates, showerhead, and faucet aerator rebates, and then a customizable rebate. The toilet rebates range from $40 to $75 per toilet. If you have an older, very high flow toilet from 1993 or earlier, and you replace it with a WaterSense certified toilet, WaterSense means it's uh, both high efficiency and is tested for quality performance. That toilet rebate is worth $75. And there are a lot of these older toilets in multifamily buildings. We've seen them through our inspections in our projects. Uh, but for the toilets that are more modern and are to using, uh, rated to use 1.6 gallons per flush, um, if that's replaced with an ultra high efficient toilet that uses only 0 0.8 gallons per flush and is water sense certified, that's a $40 rebate. This is a very popular option amongst many of our multifamily retrofit projects. <clears throat> In addition, we offer $15 for high efficiency shower heads and $5 per faucet aerator for high efficiency aerators. All combined, these have a power, powerful effect in reducing overall water usage. <clears throat> the basic rebate process is that the property owner, or through coordination with the property manager, uh, arrange for a free pre-inspection. It is free to the customer and the property owner. We send our inspector out who looks at a, a percentage of the units to get a sense of what is the existing level of fixtures at the property. This also allows us to develop a rebate estimate so that the owner and manager can decide if they want to move forward with this project. If they do move forward, then they go hire their own contractor to do the work. We're not providing the services or the labor. After the work is completed, we do a follow-up post-inspection, um, and then the owner submits the paperwork for the rebate, and a check is mailed out within 30 days. These projects typically take two to six months. It depends on how motivated the project uh, property owner is, how quickly they want to move. To date, we've completed eight multifamily retrofits um, in the city of Tampa. 
And our rebate amounts help to cover the, or help to offset the upfront costs of doing these projects. So looking at the eight projects that we've done in Tampa, our rebates covered 15 to 40 percent of those upfront costs. The project costs range widely from $8,000 to $200,000. That really d depends on how many toilets and units you're retrofitting. Is it 25 or 600 or more? And our rebates accordingly have ranged from about $2,000 to $37,000. Importantly, one of the benefits is that after that upfront rebate um, is issued, the water and wastewater bill reductions are realized every month thereafter and then can save thousands of dollars. And I'll have some images to illustrate that for you in a few slides. Before I get into that, I did want to talk about the third rebate option, and I'd like to have Josh Madden come in and talk about this partnership for the third rebate option. Hey. Josh Madden. Um, so I work for the Southwest Florida Water Management District and we have a grant program called the WISE program where we're trying to do a very similar thing to the Tampa Bay Water WISE program that Amelia's been talking about. We're trying to incentivize water conservation projects. We're just covering a larger geographical area. Um, so in the instances where, where there is a good conservation project uh, within the, the Tri-County area, within the city of Tampa, um, we partner and we offer a larger incentive than either of us can, can offer a loan. Um, so we call it the customizable rebate, a customizable incentive. Um, and this is really better fitted for uh, unique project types that are outside the normal plumbing fixtures that Amelia's been talking about. So um, probably the most applicable one for apartment complex would be irrigation. Um, improvements to the irrigation systems, uh, smart irrigation controllers that use weather data to automatically adjust run times, um, or changes to the uh, irrigation uh, sprinkler heads, putting in drip irrigation um, as an example. Um, it does not cover op like basic operation maintenance, so repairs and things like that are not eligible for the grant. Um, but in those instances where it does meet our criteria for funding, we can cover 75% of the cost, up to $40,000 uh, per project. So it can be a, a pretty substantial grant. And I will hand it back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up with a few slides on uh, th three of the case studies from multifamily project retrofits that we've done in Tampa. The first was just a toilet, a basic toilet retrofit. And this property um, earned a rebate of over $21,000 and realized a 28% reduction in their water usage. This translated to a 25% bill reduction for their water and wastewater charges. And they have continued to realize these savings uh, even two years after implementation, saving about $7,800 per month on their water and wastewater bills. The second property was fairly similar but saw an even larger water reduction, a 56% water reduction, um, and their water bill reduced by about 50%, and they earned a $15,000 rebate for this toilet retrofit project. And the last one was a combination of toilets, shower heads, and aerators. They did install the 0.8 gallon per flush toilet and saw a dramatic 68% reduction in water. All of these properties have sustained these water reductions over two years since they were implemented saving about $6,000 per month on their water and wa wastewater bills, um, representing a 44% reduction in those fees. Now I'm going to pass it on to Erica. Thank you so much. Um, so as, as you see, the more I learned about this program, the more I thought this was a great opportunity to outreach to residents, let them know what's available, uh, and get some money back while doing so. Uh, so we partnered up, had discussions around this, and we pulled some data. Uh, so I'm presenting some data on the screen now, and it is for each community redevelopment eight, uh, area. <clears throat> so they use six CCF uh, unit uh, per month unit as a cutoff for the best rebate candidates. And when this is because when billing is over the six CCF, the water charges start calculating in the next tier. So it gets more expensive and you're using more water. Uh, this data was pulled from three months uh, in, in, to identify the best candidates, and the data was from the previous calendar year in 2022. Uh, they identified 245 apartment class customers within the nine CRAs, and 56 of the 245 are billing over six CCF per month. 
Uh, East Tampa has the greatest number of potential candidates at 27. And of the 56 apartment uh, units, the likely average of the overage was six to, uh, seven to eight CCF uh, per unit per month. Uh, this can also include irrigation, laundry, pool maintenance, and other, and other water usage. So I wanted to present the data and also thank the water department and, and Ryan here uh, for doing all of this and pulling all of the addresses, zip codes. We've identified all of the best customers of the 245, the 56 that are over the average to be our strategic outreach focus to go to them first, let them know about this program, and really partner on a strategic outreach and communication effort because the program exists and we can increase utilization if we focus and target it within the community redevelopment areas. Uh, there's also some great data around potential annual savings and then replacement costs as well. So we could save uh, over a million dollars in water and wastewater and then and combined per unit is about $33,000 per unit per year. Uh, so some great data came out of this and, and more ideas. We wanted to open this up for further discussion with the board. I think the thing that we can do right away is partner for strategic communications and outreach and develop an implementation plan for outreaching to our identified complexes. And then if we do get into wanting to match funding or increasing the funding amount of the rebate available, we would need to compare this to each individual redevelopment plan uh, and, and make it work within uh, each CRP. So I wanted to open that up for discussion and just let you know about some of the, the great work and thank the team behind me. Board Member Miranda. Uh, thank you, Madam Ma Chair. Uh, I thank all of you for doing this, and uh, I believe there's two largest, the two largest water suppliers in the three county area, Pasco, Pine Hills, and Hillsborough. Tampa Bay Water produces about 200, or just a little bit over 200 million gallons of water a day. They have that big reservoir that sits about almost 16 billion gallons of water. Thank God it's there. And the city of Tampa can do up to 82 million gallons a day. We're currently buying water from Tampa Bay Water. Start out at 4 million, 7 million, I think, the last couple of days, maybe at 12 to 14 million gallons a day. So there, there's a lot of things going on. And if you remember, for the last, I don't know if some of you have been here, pretty, we have every once a year, we have a water wise award that somebody gets it. Mm -hmm. We have a plaque and they come in and show all the plants. So this is exactly what they're talking about, about saving water. In fact, if you do a five minute bath, you can save as much water as you can without doing anything else. Mm -hmm. But people, that's a, a thing that you feel hot, you feel cold, and you get a wonderful sensation when you're clean. And therefore, you got to pay the price. When you're paying the price, South Hillsborough County is growing like gangbusters. So that's the number one area now that Tampa Bay Water is looking at. Not that they're not supplying to the rest of us, they are. But we got to plan for that growth. And after that, Pasco County is in the horizon going up like, you know, real quick. So they're going to feel the same pinch that we've all been in. So it's, uh, it's a hard situation that you all are working with. And thank you for what you're doing on a daily basis. God bless you all. Board Member Herte. Uh, I want to echo to the thanks. This was a phenomenal presentation. Uh, I particularly loved the bar graph mm -hmm. that showed how much money people can save. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. That visual was really wonderful. And the only thing I'm going to ask, because I'm really glad that this, <laughs> that this is going to be a CRA focus and we are focusing there, but um, I didn't know if there was a slide or that you could possibly give out um, contact information uh, for areas that may, someone may be watching that has an apartment complex that's not necessarily in the CRA. Uh, and I just, since we're here, if we could just, uh, if you could just maybe share a phone number or an email address of how uh, a, someone interested could reach out. Absolutely, yeah. These rebate um, offerings are available to all customers, mm -hmm. water customers yeah. of the city of Tampa and the mm -hmm. other regions I described. So the main website to learn more is tampabaywaterwise.org, and um, people are welcome to reach out to me personally, Amelia Brown, a brown at tampabaywater.org. Thank you so much. And Thank again, uh, really love this presentation. So excited we're going to have this partnership um, with you all, and I look forward to hearing um, uh, the success that we have with this. This is this is something that's needed in all of our CRAs, but also throughout the city. So thank you for sharing that information for those in the rest of the city that also might be interested. Thank you so much. Thank you, Board Member Carlson. Yeah, thank you also. Um, could you go back to the slide that shows the dollar savings? Um, there, uh, one more, there you go, at the bottom. Do you know, uh, is there any way to to add up or have you all looked at the, the to convert the numbers to MGD that we could save a million gallons per day? Um, 
you had the dollar amounts there. But if we, if we had the similar results in these um, units that you're showing compared to the examples you gave, um, do we know how many, if we converted to MGD, what that would look like? Yes. <clears throat> so I have the numbers in front of me. Uh, this does focus on cost savings, but with gallons of water saved uh, annually, it would be over uh, 145 million. So it would be a 46% reduction uh, if every single one of these complexes replace their uh, toilet and or shower head. So per day, that's what, like half a, half a million or something? Oh, per day. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to break that down. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it's, it, as I said, it's, it's much cheaper to support this than it is to yeah. um, to find new sources. Um, I, I I don't know if we need to make a motion or not. I'm happy to do that um, uh, to to support a, a marketing outreach campaign. Um, it seems to me since we do um, since we have grants and other programs to help people with their roofs and and renovations mm -hmm. and things, it seems like we could be able to do this as well. Um, some of the I, I don't know what Morris will say about slum and blight, but some of it is inside the units, not out, just outside. And for people who haven't had a, a, a toilet upgraded in 50 years, um, it, it might be a luxury or a nice thing to have uh, new faucets and new toilets as well. And so once we get past this outreach stage, if it makes sense and if it's legal for us to put cash in, um, I, I would like for you all to give an update on that as well. Yeah, I took a quick look at this yesterday and looked at the statute and and at least the East Tampa plan, I think the way the CRA could potentially participate is in the affordable housing uh, component of it. If there are uh, apartment complexes or even individual homes that are uh, that meet the affordable housing component, clearly under the law, the CRA can support affordable housing, in, including utility services for affordable housing. So that, that I would feel comfortable with that component. Going outside of that is a little bit iffy for us to do. Yes, but we can we can do the marketing. But then if we're going to put cash in, we would need. Okay, um, I'll. I would like to at least make a motion to have staff come back on March twenty first to give an update on this. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Board Member Carlson, second by Board Member Maniscalco. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we need to make a motion to? approve this going forward or this is just a report that you want it right um, I, I think the report back in, back in March will indicate our, our next okay. steps yeah. so all I right think thank you good. board member Miranda Th thank you very much you, certainly you can do anything you want change the toilet have a better flow less less consumption of water however there's one thing inside that toilet <laughs> that, that everybody doesn't change is the flapper every once in a while it's called he, the flapper he loves talking about and if that, that flapper is not working right yeah. it makes no difference what kind of toilet you have yeah. So I suggest that we, I do two things right. Only two, July and December, I always change my flapper. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I have the low water rate. However, that being along, you agencies have the right, and you know already how much water is used per citizens in every city or in every county as a whole. I'm sure you have that. So maybe next time you come, you can give it. So, you know, when you embarrass someone, they'll do better. I'm serious. So if you embarrass the city of Tampa, we'll try to do better. Or St. Petersburg, or Pine Islands, or Pasco, whatever. You have to give it to them here. You're, you're way above. Now you've got to get lower. You've got to challenge somebody to do it right. But thanks again for everything you're doing. Uh, Mr. Miranda, I just want you to know that your constant talk about the flapper, I am going to change mine because. I'm glad you are. Yeah. I'm going to change it, so hopefully it'll work, and we can use that, you know, in our communication. Um, there's a great need in East Tampa, um, potential candidates. I'm glad that that was brought out in this bullet point. I will make sure to communicate it in my communication with the community. So thank you so much for your report. Okay. We are going to move forward. We've. Um, Continue. So we have item number five, which is going to be addressed by Ms. Moody. There's going to be a motion for that as well, I believe, to receive and file. Go ahead. Great. I uh, just had a, a quick discussion with the team behind me. Um, if you do co contact Amelia Brown, um, she can direct you to where you can get free flappers for replacement. Oh, okay. We'll include that in, in March as well. Yeah, Amelia. <clears throat> 
Garrett. So free flappers and tampabaywaterwise.org is the website for the community. It's through the city of Tampa. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your report. For that new <laughs> <laughs> item number five. Item number five, we are almost complete here. So item number five is the uh, motion for low income, low access uh, for staff to look at the uh, action plan on feasibility for the CRA looking at areas where there are low income, low access locations uh, to include East Tampa and to look at proposed and future developments that could potentially include grocery stores. Uh, so as I dug into this motion, we also found another motion uh, due back at City Council next Thursday on October 19th. It's the same motion, but it includes Sulphur Springs. So we've done some great uh, input and have re retrieved some data, and we look forward to presenting on walk shed accessibility, access to food resources for East Tampa and Sulphur Springs, and then we are also looking to pursue a grant for food financing and getting more access to healthy food. So uh, for the purpose of this, we'd like to move this um, to next Thursday's discussion. Well, I, will I will present along with our partners and we'll have the data and uh, look at the grant opportunity. Uh, however, uh, we have been working with stakeholders and potential grocers to bring to East Tampa specifically. So even though the motions are similar, uh, we are looking for a, a new motion to uh, continue to work with the stakeholders and provide a report uh, in January with our stakeholder engagement with an action plan for a grocery store in East Tampa. Board Member Vieira. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it, and, and I appreciate all your hard work. We, we met with um, some stakeholders, yourself, Mr. McRae, and others. Uh, Mr. Drumgo appeared as well, I believe, uh, by phone. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, in discussion, uh, I, I believe you had requested this to come back to CRA in January 18th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I can make that motion if I may at the end. But I mean, for, for me, just to briefly talk about this and why I know we all support mm -hmm. this, you know, for me, this is what CRAs are for, um, to either create the, um, you know, economic surroundings where the, the private sector can flourish and to fund that. And, and this is certainly something that's a necessity. Uh, to me, this is something that's about respect and dignity. And, you know, if I lived in an area where there wasn't a grocer or a grocery store uh, near me, I, I would be uh, very offended. I, I, I would be very angry and I would wonder where my city, where my local government is and making that happen. Um, and so I think that's why we're doing this. You know, I think our endeavor in this regard should be to build a bridge uh, so that the private sector can invest properly. Maybe we can get a, um, a private sector grocer uh, to come in immediately. Maybe we can't. Uh, I know there's community partners that, that we're talking to right now, um, but ultimately we need to build a bridge uh, such that uh, private companies uh, will feel uh, that it is a good investment to invest in East Tampa and the affected areas with a grocer uh, and, and whatnot. I certainly think that's very important. As for me, and I think we all agree with this, I'm, I'm willing to invest whatever monetary amount is necessary from the city to make sure that this is a success. Um, I'm, I'm willing to go on the record for that and say that, you know, whatever amount from the CRA, from the city of Tampa, I mean, with, within, obviously within reason and whatnot, uh, but, but we should invest very robust in this because, again, if, if this was my neighborhood, if I was there and I didn't have a grocer within me, I would be offended and I would wonder where in the world my local government is and not making this happen. So, you know, this, this is certainly something that should be priority for us and uh, in, in looking at partnerships, um, when, when the, when the, you know, the hopeful grocer, uh, happens, we can, you know, talk about uh, the, the direction and control who's going to be in charge and depends on what partners are going to be at the table. And as we discussed, uh, the, the big challenge in this is to make sure that we have stakeholder buy-in and to make sure that we speak to all of the communities in the affected areas, East Tampa, Civic Associations, neighborhood houses of worship, uh, community leaders, et cetera, to make sure that everybody has input. This is something that I know the community is very, very excited about um, and, and is uh, going to get 100% behind. And again, I know that we're going to invest whatever monetary amount it takes to get this done because if this was our neighborhood, we would want that, we would demand that, and we ought to do that. And, and, and I know all of us are very passionate about it. But again, like I said in closing, thank you for your passion on this issue. Uh, Mr. McRae, Ms., Mr. Drumgo, and everybody who's been working on this for y'all's passion. We're gonna be partnering up with the city and, and, and God willing making this happen. So thank you again. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, so, oh, oh, I, I can, at the end, I mean, Okay, I board member Miranda. No, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm just reading stuff. Okay. 
board member Clendon. And I, I know in your, uh, you, you, you're doing a lot of coordination with other um, municipalities or other organizations and all. Uh, th this is not just a Tampa problem, it's a national problem, in, in, especially in urban areas of mm -hmm. cities. Are, are you finding success, or how other municipalities have dealt with this in a successful way? Um, are there examples out there? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and that's where we need to work with grocers to make sure that they can continue to stay open, to come and bring a grocery store, but to be able to continue operations. I actually come from the field of food security and access. I opened a 33-bed organic community garden in the university area, taught about health education, started cooking classes. So there's lots of different ways and avenues that you can get at this this issue um, and do it holistically so there are models that have been successful and what we're doing is coming on uh, next Thursday and we're presenting some of those models that I'm really excited to share more information on around financing uh, low to no interest loans as well as getting uh, healthy food options in local corner stores because as we know the walkability and the bikeability is where people are going to access their food so if there's more uh, access to fresh produce, then there'll be there'll be uh, better health outcomes. So you'll be, you'll, you're going to bring a report of like where other municipalities' success stories of of, of having those types of programs. I, I can look into that and bring a report. Okay. Next Thursday is focused on the partnership with the UF IFIS Extension Office, who is Miss Monica Petrella with right. Hillsborough County with Homegrown Hillsborough, and we're going to going to be focusing on the grant that we're pursuing, uh, which is a three million dollar grant that can go up to five years. Uh, so we'll be reporting specifically on that, but I be happy to look into additional models. Yeah, I just, because I, I know this is a, a subject of, you know, being involved in areas that other areas I'm involved in. I hear this a lot mm -hmm. of other municipalities. So there's got to be, maybe there's just, maybe there's failure across the board. I don't know, but surely there's somebody who's is, is already gone down this path and they found a, an economically viable way of, of, of getting um, food providers into these areas. So you know, and, and what that what that program actually looks like. So at least we know mm -hmm. what we're biting off. And, and, and again, again, not just getting them there, but making them viable so that they stay, exactly. they stay in place. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, Board Member Carlson. The, the next step is you're coming back with a further report. Is that, what's the next step on this? So the next step is to direct staff to continue to engage with these stakeholders for potential grocery stores and come back and report on the feasibility uh, and action plan. Yeah, my, just quickly, and we can talk offline too, but to mm -hmm. say some things publicly, since we can't talk to our colleagues outside of this room, I think, um, you know, having been involved in the Tangerine Plaza issue, some in St. Petersburg, I think. Um, What's, say it again? St. Petersburg. Okay. It, it was a yeah. Mess. Yeah, and it, um, I think that, um, I think that we need to limit our financial exposure and find something that's economically sustainable. Um, I think that that um, smaller grocery stores like Duckweed distributed closer to neighborhoods um, where people can walk and buy milk and eggs and things like that would mm -hmm. be better than subsidizing a huge mm -hmm. grocery store somewhere. Um, and then uh, things like community gardens help um, with your experience and some of the other experience we've seen. What what opportunities are there there? We see in big cities they're doing vertical community gardens, putting them mm -hmm. on the top of, of parking garages. Yep. Um, so anything that, that is, is sustainable economically that can, where we can give it a jump start and then let it go forward. The other thing is that, you know, we've had some people, developers approach us lately and say, we'll give us $5 million or whatever and then we'll build a grocery store. I, if we bought an office condo, like if there's a, if we're building neighborhood commercial districts and we bought an office condo where we could put a little grocery store so we own the real estate and we could give subsidized rent, at least we would have the equity of owning the space instead of just giving away money. Mm -hmm. I'm not in favor of giving big chunks of money to a developer, but if we can partner with them so that we own part of the space, then at least at some point we could divest of the real estate and we would have some asset that we could, um, that we could work with. So then our, our subsidy would be maybe just lower rent. Here, here. Thank you. So I like the sound of that. Anyone else? Board member Hertek and board member Vieira. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate you talking about the smaller uh, grocers. And I just wanted to bring to your attention in Ebor, there is the Black Radish Grocer. And if you haven't talked to that um, group, it's strictly a vegan grocery store. And it's been here for over a year. It's adorable. I mean, they do phenomenal work. Um, next to them also is a community garden. I believe it's called Power to the People. Uh, and that's a brand new community garden. And 
again, they are right next to each other. I don't know how much of a communi communication they have together, mm -hmm. but again, having those two things right next to each other, figuring out a model that has been sustainable for Black Radish uh, to, ha to possibly be able to not necessarily even expand that, but just how did that work for them? Mm -hmm. How has it been successful? I um, talked to Duckweed as well, but I just didn't know. Duckweed's more well known. I didn't know if you knew about Black Radish, mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Black Radish is wonderful. Good. And it's cute and tiny and yep. in, in the community walkable. Thank you for your report. We have some more comments by board member uh, Miranda and Matascalco. No, no, you're okay? Okay. Perfect. I just want to say thank you. You know, before this, before the end of these four years in this term, I'd like to see the, uh, the grocery store issue, whether it's something smaller like a duckweed that was mentioned or others, because you do have the food desert in East Tampa. You have the food deserts in Sulphur Springs, and that's something that came up, has come up for years, number one. Number two, through the campaign, housing was the biggest item. Maybe transportation second, but food deserts and addressing those food deserts. Once you go down, once you pass the Winn-Dixie on Nebraska, mm -hmm. east of there, it's a food desert. You go on Hillsboro, you have San Juan and you have Walmart. But once you go east of 15th, it gets real quiet. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opportunity. And not just that, there's a lot of density out there. There's a lot of residents that mm -hmm. they have to travel very far just to get what, I mean, like I can walk, whatever, it's a quarter of a mile away, but I can walk to the Publix, you know, or I can go to the Fresco y Mas, which used to be a, a Winn-Dixie. Um, there's, there's other options. West Tampa, is South Tampa, they have so many Publixes, it's crazy, on top of the Walmarts, on top of everything else. The rest of the city flourishes with the basic amenities. A grocery store and access to good, clean, healthy food, uh, those are basic amenities that the rest of the city has, but Sulphur Springs, one of the poorest neighborhoods and underserved neighborhoods, doesn't have that. Uh, East Tampa in general, which East Tampa is the biggest CRA. Mm -hmm. uh, when I see biggest CRA, I see biggest opportunity. And we have to address yeah. those issues. It's, people are asking for the basics, you know, besides housing. You know, they just want access to, to basic necessities. So I, I want to make it a goal that before the end of these four years that we see those things come to fruition, whether it's smaller uh, grocers, whether it's big box, whether it's, you know, we talk about, we were talking about the Straz earlier. Downtown wasn't 30 years ago what, what it is today, 10 years ago what it is today. Uh, but people saw that the opportunity was there. Water Street didn't exist, look at it now. The Challenge District, you know, nothing like it is today. We have to look at these places that are underserved and underprivileged as places for opportunity. And, and you, we start with the vision and we go from there. And we have the vision today. And, uh, but we have to set those goals and, and make those happen. Councilmember Miranda mentioned uh, Governor slash former Mayor Martinez. You know, he wanted to get that Performing Arts Center built, and they were able to find a way to get it done. We need to find a way to get this done. So, um, again, that's a goal that, that I'd like to make, that I think we, we, we should all make, so that, you know, before this term is up, we, we see these things come to fruition. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. A Jefferson Dragon, by the way, Governor Martinez. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ms. Moody, thank you so much for this report. Um, East Tampa and groceries is a priority. It, I heard so much about it on the campaign trail. But not only that, you know, it's, especially when you live in an environment where particularly I can get to so many grocery stores, it's really ridiculous. And including one in East Tampa that I would consider close to me, which is the Publix in Winn-Dixie, but I can come this way and I just have so many options. And this is a reasonable thing and the diving into this issue and what board member Colson said, uh, we should be thinking outside the box and not necessarily big. It benefiting us in, in this way in terms of real estate. Um, I, do we have other people, other communities that we're, we don't have to buy the grocery stores in other communities um, for developers to come in. This is an opportunity for us to create, be creative. I don't really know about duckweed, but I like what I was hearing regarding that. So um, hopefully we don't dismiss any of these comments. Let's think small, like black radish and duckweed. And um, thank you so much for the report. I appreciate it. And board member Vieira, you want to? Uh, yeah, if I may. And and I and, and and thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And yeah, a lot of good comments. And you know, I I, I really do believe that we can uh, mm -hmm. uh, have this done by the end of our 
uh, four years. I mean, it, it can be our, our man on the moon challenge. I mean yeah. that. I, I, I really think that we can. And it's important to learn from the mistakes that other communities have made and, and as well as their successes. And again, when it comes to me, uh, monetarily with, within reasonable investments, I think we ought to you know, do it in a robust way. And I'm down for whatever uh, for that, mm -hmm. uh, 110%. Uh, so if I may, I uh, motion for CRA staff to collaborate with stakeholders to build <clears throat> or renovate a grocery store in East Tampa and to develop an action plan and proposed timeline and propose, but pr report back to the board at the January 18th, 2024 meeting. I can't believe we're almost in 2024. I know. I know. Presidential election, but 2024 meeting. Okay, we have a motion by board member Vieira, second by board member Hertek. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank Great. you so much. <clears throat> Moving on you. to item number eight, CAC appointments for West Campus CRA. Yes, yes. And um, just a reminder, we will. I'll be back next Thursday to pre present alongside the experts in economic development. So I really look forward to the discussion, and this was a great uh, preface to today. Uh, and then that is all for staff reports, and then we're moving into the consent agenda. Yeah, the, the required approvals for your oh, yes. recent, mo uh, recent motion, you can unless you those. want to pull one of the other items, you can move we can all of them those. and move to approve all the approvals. <laughs> other than items <laughs> eight, 7 uh, and 11. Those are the only... Minus 7 it, and Yeah, minus... We did 7. We right. did 7, and we um, continued 11, so... Move to approve everything except 7 and 11. Okay. okay. I have a motion by Board Member Maniscalco, second by Board Member Hertek for our consent agenda items. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We're moving on to new business. Board members. <laughs> I think we should show enthusiasm for being done uh, by uh, what? Noon. Okay, new business. What day? Uh, for what? Noon of what day? Today. Okay, I'll see sure. you all this afternoon. Uh, I just 24. want to make sure. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion if I may. Yes, sir. Board member Miranda. Yeah. I would like to make a motion to have Tampa Police Department update the security and safety plan and oh. to identify additional manpower and scheduling costs that may be needed. These costs should be recouped by, from the CRA considering the budget restrictions and the recent approval general fund budget. And I believe it is in it appropriate CRA cost considering the safety of residents, businesses, and visitors through the entire Ybor City area. If at all possible, I'd like to be, i like for the TPD to present it by in December CRA Sorry. meeting. But before you all move on this, yes. a couple of things. The CRA cannot pay for basic police services. Right. I understand. Um, mm -hmm. And what the, what the CRA can participate in is a community policing innovation that's approved by the city, not by the CRA board. Okay. Yeah. So the first, the first step is for the, the, plan. The, for the plan to be approved by the city, and then for that cost then to come before you for I'll, the I'll, I'll withdraw the motion then until I get to the city. Okay. Okay. Oh, Which okay. is an RFP. What uh, city? If, <laughs> if I could comment on it uh, as well. Sure, Ms. Mo uh, Ms. Moody. Is, is that okay? Um, yes, so this is in regards to the Community Innovation Action Plan that's currently underway. I do have a target deadline of February 2024, uh, so I would be happy to come and present the first draft of that Community Policing Plan. And what it does is it outlines all of the activities within each redevelopment area that are happening that add to public safety. And again, that plan has to be approved by the City, city. Council, no. not the CRA Board. Okay, yeah, and it does not replace police services. Board Member Hertet. Thank you, and the only thing um, that I would like to add to that, again, as, as we know, CRAs have a deadline. So, again, my, my work uh, in international development, whenever we look at a project, the very first thing we do, and one of the things you have to consider before you even get the project, is how are you, gonna, how are you going to uh, eventually um, put those responsibilities on the community itself. And so knowing, I mean, we still have 12 years of the CRA, but how then, as we're looking at this, do we see that going forward so it's not a drain on the community's policing resources in that, in District 3? Um, so, so looking also, yes, at funding now and what we can do now, but also in the future, exactly. how, do we, how do we balance that? Because the CRA money's not gonna be here forever. Well, again, I mean, th let me just, the, the provision of police services is a basic city function, so that needs to be covered by the city, the city budget. What the CRAs are allowed to do are community policing innovations, 
And so there has to be a plan for some in innovative leasing activity that goes beyond the basic level of service for that area. And so, yes, and so that how that gets budgeted 10 or 12 years down the road, if that's still needed, then that would need to be addressed. And But the whole idea is to come up with an innovative program that goes over and above and beyond what the basic police service level is. Yeah. I just want to and I agree with that. I'm just saying that we should always be looking forward to, um, as we only have 12 years left, it sounds like a long time, but it really isn't. Okay, so the motion was withdrawn, right? Board member Vieira. Yes, just one if I may. I was talking to our friends at the county um, on the um, World War I memorial marker at uh, Memorial Cemetery uh, mm -hmm. and uh, County Commissioner Josh Wassel, uh, the man who's always sporting a, a nice blue jacket, uh, expressed some concern, or some um, willingness, I guess, if you will, to uh, work with the CRA or the city to help restore uh, uh, that uh, World War I memorial marker for African-American soldiers killed in action in World War I. So I'd like to have, if I may, the CRA staff meet with the Hillsborough County, with Hillsborough County uh, to talk about restoring that uh, World War I memorial marker at uh, Memorial Cemetery and come back in February. That's fine. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the floor by Board Member Vieira, second by Board Member Maniscalco. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion Thank carries. You. Board member Clendenin. Oh no, I'm sorry. I keep you're so quiet. <laughs> she just has a favorite. I just wait till next month. She just has Board a member Maniscalco. No. Any new business? No, I'm good. Board member Clendenin. You know, I'm probably going to say it again uh, this evening when we meet as, as a city council, but I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that last Saturday there was a horrific attack in, in, in Israel mm -hmm. that cost, you know, over, what 1,200 lives and women, men, and children. And I just wanted to acknowledge that, that the loss and, um, you know, that I know there's a lot of folks in the city of Tampa that have a lot of loved ones in Israel and that are worried about, about what, you know, what's mm -hmm. happening over there. And I just want to just say that, you know, uh, my, our, our thoughts and prayers are with, are with, with Israel and the families that have, uh, have lost uh, loved ones. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Board Member Hurtek. Nothing. Board Member Carlson. <laughs> Motion to receive and foul. So moved. <laughs> We have a motion to receive and file. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Um, you can go to lunch and don't come back. What if I want to come back? Yeah, I'm sitting here till 501. <laughs> exactly.